morning everyone so uh today we are going to start off with uh some introductions and kind of get you familiar with what we're doing here today uh so uh first i'd like to thank you for joining uh this is the cox health emergency responder training series um we are uh currently working with all of our outside agencies uh, to try to provide some continuing education during these uh, unique COVID times. Um, <clears throat> something to know a little bit about us here at Cox Health, uh, one of our missions uh, or our mission is to uh, provide high quality health care to the communities we serve um, and we want to do that through high quality education and research and that's what uh, the big push for this continuing education series comes from. Um, so uh, First off, I'd like to thank some people uh, that helped kind of get this thing started. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Kyle Meadows and Aubrey Johnson uh, for kind of helping facilitate and organizing this event. I'd also like to thank Russell Scanlon uh, for just uh, giving us the support and helping us get the resources we need to be able to put this together for you guys. Um, we hope that it's a value for you and that uh, you're able to get um, a lot of good information through this series. I'd also like to thank Brandon Foster, who's the producer. He's the one been helping us work through uh, live streaming all of this and getting this information out to you in a, in a high quality fashion. And then also Jessica Estes uh, for being here and helping moderate, kind of working as the intermediary between myself and you guys out there watching this live. Um, I think we're good to go ahead and get started. Um, so Brandon, if you want to key up the PowerPoint here, uh, we will get started. Okay, so um, we are going to cover time critical diagnoses here uh, when seconds count. So this is going to be a um, review of the major TCDs that we see in the Southwest Missouri area. And then we're also going to be covering some emergent diagnoses that kind of coincide with some of the care and the, the methodologies and the ways that we kind of handle these TCD scenarios. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, before I get too far into this, though, I want to challenge you as you begin this series. We've got four hours ahead of us of continuing education, and sometimes that can be a little difficult to sit through, especially uh, watching on your phone. Um, so I want to challenge you. I want to ask you, uh, why are you here right now? Um, you know, Frederick Nietzsche said, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. Uh, as you sit through this education, I hope that you can find something that inspires you to go out there and be a better provider. Um, I hope that you find something that inspires you to go out and uh, make a difference in other providers' lives, other responders, uh, because ultimately, as we work together to improve our performance, uh, the care that we provide for our patients drastically improves. Uh, okay, so uh, just a quick little uh, review and recap here of the objectives that we're gonna be covering today. Uh, first thing we want to do is we want to be able to accurately describe all the major TCDs as well as emergent diagnoses. Uh, we also want you to help you be able to explain the pathology, path, excuse me, pathophysiology of TCDs just in layman's terms, uh, just a general understanding of what's going in the body, why it's what's going on in the body, why it's occurring, uh, and that will kind of help us understand why we make the treatment decisions that we make long term. Um, we also want to help you with identifying specific, specific signs and symptoms that are related to those TCDs and being able to uh, correlate them appropriately, being able to relate them back to the corresponding TCD. Uh, we also want to help you work towards uh, being able to demonstrate a con comprehensive MARCH exam, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is as we get into the different time critical diagnoses. Uh, Really want to help you guys kind of understand what definitive care is and be able to define what definitive care is. And then uh, we want to be able to help you uh, create a, a kind of a cumulative list of what are the definitive care needs that the patient has and then how to achieve those definitive care needs in a pre-hospital environment. How to efficiently and effectively uh, navigate the patient through the healthcare continuum to receive the highest quality healthcare that they can, and ultimately resulting in a um, high quality outcome at discharge from hospital. And we'll talk a little bit about why we are uh, concerned about discharge from hospital as we get into this. So, uh, I'm gonna change things up a little bit. Normally this is a pretty interactive class and I open it up to the 
to the students in the room, but uh, obviously it's going to be kind of difficult uh, with you guys. So the first thing what I want to do is uh, identify what are the major TCDs that are uh, recognized by the greater Southwest Missouri area. And I honestly, I think it's the entire state of Missouri. Um, I think most states follow this. Uh, a couple of them may have some, some differences and we'll talk about that. <clears throat> but so, uh, the three major time critical diagnoses. Okay. The first one's going to be trauma, right? So significant trauma. Uh, those are the things where you hear like class one trauma or a patient that needs to go to a trauma center. You have significant trauma stroke, Right, and we'll talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of stroke um, and STEMI. Right, and we'll talk a little bit about the difference between STEMI and, and MI and some of the other things. Um, and then moving along, we're going to have some emergent diagnoses that kind of uh, require a lot of, uh, of care from us initially and requires a lot of us as providers in a very time sensitive environment. Uh, and those are going to be the emergent diagnoses. Um, so, uh, the first one is going to be sepsis we're going to talk about. Um, we're also going to talk about cardiac and respiratory arrest. Um, we're also going to be talking about uh, OB emergencies and some of the life threats associated with those OB emergencies. And then we'll talk a little bit about hypo and hyperglycemia. Now. Uh, something to be noted, usually I open up this to the floor and ask providers, um, you know, what are some other diagnoses that you would consider time critical? Um, and just kind of get their perspective. Oftentimes people will say things like, uh, like maybe overdose. Um, they say things like maybe an excited delirium or uh, various things like that. <clears throat> so, but we're going to cover these today. We're going to talk about the pathophysiology behind them. And then we're also going to talk about uh, pre-hospital management of these diagnoses uh, in the field. So, okay. So, uh, before we get into the different TCDs and uh, kind of what's going on in the body, first thing I want to talk about is definitive care. Um, oftentimes, uh, especially in a pre-hospital environment, uh, we, we don't consider the long-term care of the patient in that initial interaction because we have so many things tugging at our attention to be able to manage, to be able to treat, to be able to identify. Um, and so I think it's important that we, we get this idea of what is definitive care early on because that's going to help us um, make decisions in regards to patient care. So, uh, so definitive care is going to be the care that is rendered conclusively, okay, conclusively, totally in its entirety to manage a patient's condition. That would be things like a uh, full range of preventative care, curative, acute care, covalescent care, restorative care, and even re rehabilitation, rehabilitation medical care. And so <clears throat> um, what does this mean? What does this look like in, a, in the grand scheme of what we do? Um, what you kind of have to think about is, uh, you know, if I have a patient, we'll use trauma, for example, because that's one of the first things that we're going to go over. Um, <clears throat> if you have a patient who has significant trauma, one of the things you should be considering is what kind of treatments will this patient need long term in order to get to a high quality uh, prognosis at dis discharge from hospital. And so what that may look like if you have a patient who, say, has an amputated left leg. Uh, obviously, they're going to need some initial hemorrhage control, bleeding control, and then, you know, going into the hospital, they're going to work with a surgeon, um, and, you know, they may do some uh, surgery on the patient, uh, and the, the patient may end up with a prosthetic. Now, as you think about that continuing, continuum of care, going past the emergency room and actually into working with uh, the, the individuals who... Uh, you know, help get the prosthetic set up for the patient and then going into the rehabilitation centers and helping that person learn to walk with a prosthetic, um, various things like that. Those kind of things can be affected by our care initially in the field. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through each one of the time critical diagnoses. Uh, but things you want to consider uh, in the moment, you know, what kind of, of care is your patient going to need? And that could be, a, you know, correlated with whatever differential diagnosis your patient has. Um, 
what kind of resources are they going to need? You know, are they going to need specific things? Do they need uh, ventilatory equipment? Do they need a uh, respiratory therapist? Do they need a cardiologist? Do they need a, a CT scanner? We're going to talk a little bit about that long term. So uh, we're also going to be talking about the availability of those resources because, uh, and similar to the point down on the bottom, your location and your ability to get to uh, definitive care or uh, maybe where you select to take the patient so that they can get to definitive care uh, will be a little bit dictated by, by the availability of that care. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, so now that we understand what definitive care is, uh, let's talk a little bit about shock. So um, <clears throat> one thing that we kind of want to get off right out the gate is this understanding of, of what is shock. So um, really, shock is, you know, boiled down into the simplest form. It is inadequate blood flow to the body's tissue right? Uh, so essentially there is something that's occurred uh, within that vasculature somewhere, whether it's a block, a bleed, um, you know, something has gotten damaged that is preventing the blood flow from carrying the nutrients that the tissue needs. Things like oxygen and glucose and all those things that, sur that support that aerobic environment and cellular metabolism and all of that, right? The perfusion of oxygen and glucose, right? <clears throat> now, Something we know about the body is that the longer that the body goes without those nutrients, the worse it performs, right? Uh, and we also know that uh, tissue, as it begins to get starved of those nutrients that it needs, will begin to die, right? Uh, which is why the name of the game for first responders is perfusion. If you can boil your job down to one thing, it's perfusion, and being able to support perfusion. Now, there are lots of different types of shock um, <clears throat> so, uh, just cut some of the ones that we're going to talk about a little bit here are going to be, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about hypovolemic. Actually, that's probably what we'll spend most of our time on. We'll talk a little bit about obstructive and some cardiogenic shock as well. There are other things like neurogenic shock, distributive shock, um, those various things. Um, but the thing is, and if you can, if you can remember back on that slide just before this one, there's the doctor and the nurse saying the patient's in shock and uh, they say, well, what kind? Is it distributive? Is it neurogenic? Is it, uh, you know, the idea of, of identifying what kind of shock they're in isn't as important as treating the symptoms of shock, right? Which is going to be that, that inadequate perfusion. And that inadequate perfusion is going to cause decreased level of consciousness. It's going to potentially uh, cause a weak or absent radial pulse as the, as the patient's volume begins to be affected through various different things, which we're going to talk about later. Um, <clears throat> and then to that, that patient's probably, as they, as they progress into shock, they're going to present pale, cool, diaphoretic, uh, maybe even just pale, cool, clammy initially. <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about why that happens as we get into this. Um, so, um, so yeah, so moving right along, uh, we're going to, we're going to start this off in trauma and we're going to spend a fair amount of time in trauma because I think it's something that people can kind of easily grasp their head around and it helps me, it helps us kind of illustrate, um, some of the other things that are at play when we talk about strokes and STEMIs and some of those other emergent diagnoses. It, it just, it really helps drive those points home. So, um, if any of you have ever sat through a, a TC3 class, you've probably heard uh, that there are three major preventable deaths on the battlefield, right? Um, they did, I believe it was the Crash 2 study uh, in which they found out, you know, what are the, the preventable deaths on the battlefield? What are the things that we can immediately fix that don't require um, this huge amount of resources that we can fix immediately and easily? And the, the three things that were identified were uncontrolled massive hemorrhage, uncontrolled bleeding, tension pneumothorax, and an obstructed or compromised airway. Okay, So the three preventable deaths on the battlefield were uncontrolled massive hemorrhage, tension pneumothorax, and obstructed or compromised airway. Now something that I want to kind of uh, 
close the gap between for you guys is this idea of battlefield care versus uh, EMS care or, or pre-hospital care for first responders. Um, while first responders don't face the same life threats that say a soldier will face in combat, we do face life threats. Uh, and we also face something very similar to them, which is the dynamic austere environment. We have variables that continually change. Our resources to be able to take care of patients change. The patients that we uh, take care of obviously change in the dynamic of their um, of their um, of their wound paths and all of those kind of things change. And then also um, we uh, um, the the ability to care for the patient changes. So. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, moving right along, we're going to go back to that. So uh, remember, your three preventable deaths on the battlefield are going to be uncontrolled massive hemorrhage, tension pneumothorax, and obstructed or compromised airway. And like I was saying before, when, you, when you're trying to close that gap between battlefield care and pre-hospital care for first responders, um, something else that, that I want you to consider is... Um, how the environment may affect the decisions that you make. Any of you who have experience working in a pre-hospital environment, taking care of patients, you know that sometimes where the patient is located, the, the dynamic of how severe their, their uh, illness or injury is will affect some of the decisions you make in, or initially early on in that patient care. So uh, now that we know that, let's talk a little bit about how do we how do we navigate treating those issues? Um, you know, those three, those three diagnoses, the uncontrolled massive hemorrhage, tension pneumo, and obstructed or compromised airway, aren't necessarily unique to a battlefield environment. If you have a patient who's, uh, you know, say the driver of a vehicle that's struck uh, head on by another vehicle, uh, uncontrolled massive hemorrhage is a real potential problem. Tension pneumothorax is also a real potential problem. And then definitely obstructed or compromised airway due to the the mechanism of injury involved in that uh, accident. Uh, and then also just different things, whether it's a patient who, you know, falls down a cliff while they're hiking or, um, you know, various different things that they may uh, face. Now, if you guys can remember, if you've ever been through a first responder course or an EMT course or paramedic course, you've probably seen this, right? And I left it kind of bland on the screen for a reason, right? There is a lot of information there, right? This is the, the National Registry Trauma Assessment. You have to be able to recite this and navigate through this in order to get your EMT or your paramedic license. <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of information there, and that can be hard to remember, and especially trying to remember that in a uh, dynamic, stressful scene, uh, it's easy to forget some of these steps. And so what we're gonna talk about is a different algorithm that will allow you to navigate the trauma assessment in its entirety, uh, but in a way that's a little bit easier to remember and something that's a little bit more efficient and effective and reproducible, okay? So what we're gonna talk about is something that um, we uh, that we teach through our SOCOM program that we've learned through them, um, and that is the MARCH algorithm, okay? So M-A-R-C-H, MARCH. The M stands for massive hemorrhage, right? So uncontrolled bleeding. The R, or sorry, the A stands for airway, right? Now there's an important correlation and, and uh, differentiation that needs to be made here. Airway is the anatomy of the body, whereas the R, respirations, is the actual ventilation and cellular respiration, the, the gas exchange at the cellular level, the gas that's needed by the tissue getting to the tissue, right? Airway is anatomy, respirations is the actual ventilation and ventilatory effort of a patient, right? <clears throat> and then C, circulation, right? We gotta be able to perfuse those nutrients around as they're needed. And then to tie everything up, the H is head injury, hypothermia, and then hypovolemia. Um, now you may be wondering why did I choose a bunch of graduated cylinders to illustrate this point. We'll talk a little bit later as we get into the different diagnoses that hypovolemia can be caused by several different things. We can have hypovolemia because we've just lost the volume, but then we can also have hypovolemia because the shape of our container has changed. 
as our vasculature dilates the container that is, that is holding the, the blood product that we need to move around gets larger. And as it gets larger, you can see the larger diameter of the graduated cylinder, the lower the, the volume appears to be. And when you talked about a hydraulic system, which is essentially what the cardiovascular system is, right? A hydraulic pump that continually moves and circulates blood. If I lose the volume needed to prime that pump, which would also be known as preload, right? Uh, then my afterload's gonna, gonna decrease, right? Because if I lose preload, I lose afterload. And if that happens, then the system begins to fail. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna get into um, some of the intricacies of each one of those steps, the MARCH, massive hemorrhage, uh, airway, respiration, circulation, head injury, hypothermia, and um, uh, hypovolemia. All right, so massive hemorrhage, right? Pretty straightforward, right? We have massive bleeding. Now, most people think of massive hemorrhage as external hemorrhage. Um, but remember that you can have massive bleeding internally. If you have a solid organ that's damaged, say like you have a, a laceration to your spleen, uh, or also you could potentially have a closed injury to the leg, uh, maybe a broken femur, and potentially damage to that femoral artery, you can have massive hemorrhage internally. Um, also, when we talk a little bit about OB emergencies, you can have massive hemor internal hemorrhage there. Um, and then especially if you get into any kind of bleeding within the, what we call the box, right? The, the nose to the navel, anything in this chest and abdomen area, um, you can hemorrhage a significant amount of the blood volume in your body into your abdominal cavity and your, and your chest cavity and not even know it. Not gonna see a whole lot outside of the signs of shock right? <clears throat> Which, if you can remember, the signs of shock are going to be pale, cool, diaphoresis, and altered mental status, right? Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into circulation and hypovolemia. <clears throat> so, let's talk about what is, what is life-threatening bleeding. So, uh, when, you, when you're looking for life-threatening bleeding, one of the things you want to look for is pulsing or steady bleeding from the wound, right? That's pretty obvious. That's what most of us know in uh, just the general world, right? <clears throat> um, if we see blood that is spurting out, then we need to stop that. Uh, also, is there blood pooling on the ground? Is there a significant amount of blood surrounding your patient? Now, uh, there's a special note that should be made here, uh, and it's one that I learned from Russ Scanlon, uh, and that's that the where your patient is, the ground that they're laying on, can sometimes affect how you perceive that blood loss. For example, if you have a patient who is lying on a tile floor, that tile floor is going to show the amount of blood very, very well, right? It's not going to seep in. But say you have a patient lying on a, you know, like a 1970s shag carpet, that, uh, that blood's going to be absorbed into that carpet and even maybe into that subfloor and that, that padding that sits under the carpet. And so you may walk up to the patient and not even see significant hemorrhage uh, because it's all made it into the carpet and down into that subfloor. <clears throat> and so your patient may only present as pale. Uh, so that's something you need to consider when you start looking at the uh, blood pooling on the ground. Now, um, <clears throat> something else to consider is, is if the overlying clothes are soaked with blood. Um, there, it takes a fair amount of volume to really saturate uh, clothing or cloth in general. And so if, you are, if you're able to touch a piece of cloth and blood starts to drip or ooze out, then it's very saturated. And you want to be considered about uh, um, potential significant hemorrhage there. Um, <clears throat> same thing with bandages. If you've placed bandages on the patient, uh, if the patient came to you with bandages um, and they are saturated, they may, they may be, you may still have massive hemorrhage occurring. Also that patient, um, then uh, we will have massive hemorrhage. Um, so anytime, um, anytime somebody loses a limb, anytime somebody, you know, um, uh, partially loses a limb, if you have a partial amputation, there's going to be risk for significant, actually, most likely there is guaranteed going to be massive hemorrhage due to the arteries, uh, perfusing that limb. And then finally, um, if there was bleeding prior to, uh, and the patient is obviously now in shock, maybe you don't currently have massive bleeding but your patient is pale, cool, diaphoretic, maybe they're altered, those kind of things, okay? 
Um, so uh, just as a general recap, pulsing, pulsing or uh, steady oozing from a wound, significant blood on the ground next to the patient, saturated clothes or uh, bandages, amputation, um, and then patient presenting in shock, pale, cool, diaphoretic, and altered. Those are going to be some signs of significant massive hemorrhage. All right, everybody. So we're back from break now. Um, one thing I wanted to do that I forgot to do initially here, and th thankful that they reminded me, I didn't introduce myself. So um, my name is Owen Aldridge. Uh, I am a field supervisor for Cox Health EMS here in the city of Springfield, Missouri, uh, and the greater Greene County area. Um, I also work uh, with the Cox Health EMS Education Department in our Recruit Academy. Uh, which is the academy that we put all our EMTs and paramedics through as they join our organization. And we kind of get them prepped for everything going on out in the field and getting them operationally ready to act as a provider in the field. Uh, and I also work with um, the SOCOM program, which is the Special Operations uh, uh, Combat Medics. And uh, I work with, uh, with them as an instructor and as a preceptor to help get them ready for their national registry tests. Um, so that's a little bit about myself. I've been with Cox for about uh, six years now. Um, so, and I've been a field supervisor for about two. Um, so really, really enjoyed it and uh, hope that uh, whatever I can offer you here gives you a little bit of value. So, okay. So moving back into things, we're gonna kind of pick up the pace a little bit here. Um, <clears throat> we discussed bleeding. And so if you can remember back to that, that slide there, we've got um, pulsing or steady bleeding from the wound, uh, pooling, um, saturated clothing or bandaging, uh, amputation or uh, obvious signs of shock. That's when life threatening or bleeding is life threatening. <clears throat> so when you are in a traumatic situation or specifically a, a, a patient who has suffered a traumatic injury, the number one priority, the name of the game is going to be hemorrhage control, right? Bleeding control, right? Everything starts with circulation at that point. Um, if I'm in a mass casualty situation, I want to triage my patients and stop massive hemorrhage as quickly as possible. Uh, I'm gonna prioritize that over airway even in the sense of supporting airway, opening airway, because if I don't have blood product to move the appropriate nutrients around, then it doesn't matter how much oxygen or ventilation that I give them. Uh, I need to be able to support the perfusion of all those nutrients and something that we've learned over the years through EMS is I can't just replace the fluid that's lost. I have to have a very specific thing and we'll talk about that when we get into uh, circulation. So, um, okay, so uh, yeah, number one preventable death is uncontrolled massive hemorrhage. It is your top priority. Uh, I think in that crash two study, they identified that over 2,500 deaths occurred in Vietnam secondary to just massive hemorrhage. And these are just extremity wounds, things that can be stopped with tourniquets and, and bandaging and, and direct pressure. We'll talk a little bit about that. So, uh, so when, when you come up to do that massive hem, a couple minutes, we're going to spend a lot of time going over it, but this is something that as we go through these, you're going to be doing within seconds, most likely. Um, and so initially in the massive hemorrhage stage, you want to be able to assess for unrecognized hemorrhage and control the major sources of bleeding. Um, you can do that through a visual sweep as you approach your patient, right? Your provider impression, you're going to look, do I see any massive external hemorrhage? Do I see any obvious bleeding? Do I see any obvious swelling and bruising of the patient? Um, and then one thing I want to do is I want to do a complete head to toe sweep, actually touching my patients with my hands, right? Touching, touching the head, touching the chest, ch touching the pelvis, the legs, the, the ax pits, you know, checking the groin, all those areas that are highly vasculature and making sure that I don't have any bleeding. And then as I do that sweep, I'm gonna be checking my hands to see if I have blood. If I have blood, then I know I've identified a potential wound and I need to inspect that further. I can do that very quickly, right? Um, <clears throat> if I find bleeding, uh, I gotta determine, is it, is it life-threatening bleeding or is it not? If it's a minor bleed, if it's an abrasion, then I'm just gonna move right along. It doesn't concern me. Uh, but if it's major bleeding, I'm gonna apply direct pressure. I'm gonna expose that wound and then use some type of bandaging technique, whether it's, you know, uh, hemostatic dressings or tourniquet use or, you know, the various different things we'll talk about. Um, if it's a pelvic injury, I may consider using uh, a pelvic binder. Um, you know, if there's any type of potential injury like a, a pelvic fracture or something from a blast injury. Um, if I've received a patient uh, from another provider and they've already um, 
done some bandaging and, and patient care, some treatments, then I'm going to probably recheck those treatments as well. If a patient already has a tourniquet on or, you know, you show up to a home where a patient, you know, punched a glass window and they may have tied a towel around the arm, we all know that's probably not a sufficient tourniquet. <clears throat> we may need to uh, address that and, you know, go with something that's a little more definitive. And then anything that's not amenable to a tourniquet, we want to consider using direct pressure, wound packing, um, bandaging, and uh, even potentially junctional tourniquets in those, those uh, junctional areas like the, uh, the armpits or the, the groin where the legs meet the pelvis uh, where I can't get a tourniquet. <clears throat> so uh, obvious ways to control bleeding, right? We've got tourniquets, we've got quick clot hemostatic agents, and we've got various different types of bandaging. Um, we're not going to go really in depth into the, the ways that you use them. Uh, I encourage you, if you're unfamiliar with any of this equipment, reach out uh, either to us here in the education department at Cox or your service area and see if you can get some one-on-one -on -one training uh, because all of these things are the most effective when you're familiar with them and you can use them effectively. So um, moving right along, let's move into airway. So remember, airway is the anatomy and that's why I've got this picture up here, right? It's going to be the oropharynx, the nasopharynx, right? The, the larynx going into the lower respiratory tract, um, all the lower respiratory airways and into the lungs and the vasculature of the lungs. Uh, when we talk about airway management though, um, and I'm gonna share a little bit about what we do here. We use an elevate to success um, kind of algorithm in regards to airway management. Um, and so we wanna do the least invasive thing first and especially in, a, in an MCI style incident, uh, these may be some of the things that you can do really quick that will help uh, ensure a patient has a positive outcome. And so in this elevate to success algorithm, uh, the first thing that we want to be able to do, and you can, you can go back and forth on um, whether the first and second kind of which one comes first, the chicken or the egg. I generally teach uh, if you can do a head tilt chin lift or a jaw thrust, depending on the mechanism, just to open up that airway, right? If, you've, if you're running into a mass casualty scene where there's been a, a mass shooting, um, you may just be triaging patients to keep their airway open as you navigate through uh, stopping that massive bleeding. <clears throat> uh, and then additionally to that uh, is the left lateral recumbent position, and that's putting the patient onto the left side uh, using gravity as your friend. Remember, gravity in regards to your airway is your friend. Uh, putting them in the left lateral recumbent kind of ensures that they don't aspirate on anything, vomit, blood, various different things. Uh, and it just kind of keeps that airway open, make sure that they don't occlude their own airway with their tongue and various different things. And it's a quick thing you can do as you navigate through your patient care. Um, those two things uh, I use more often than half of the things that we're about to cover, okay? Um, <clears throat> and uh, the head tilt chin lift is one that I use in combination with a lot of these things. So the head tilt chin lift is definitely a go-to for me. Um, <clears throat> Uh, going back to airway management, uh, we talked about head tilt, chin lift, jaw thrust, and we're going into that left lateral recumbent. Now, uh, before we go into kind of more of the more of the airway management, we have some supportive airway measures that we can use, and that's going to be things like uh, supportive oxygenation, things through nasal cannulas um, and non rebreathers, right? And this is where we're really just trying to support and promote oxygenation of the patient. Uh, if our patient really has ventilatory issues, uh, which we'll talk about in respirations, um, we may go ahead and skip that and move into uh, using a NPA or an OPA to maintain airway patency, um, and then uh, using a BVM, whether with a face mask, uh, if you're using an airway adjunct, or potentially, <clears throat> um, you know, placing a, a superglottic airway, or as we go through this, uh, something more definitive. Now a note, uh, along with the head tilt, chin lift, jaw thrust, you probably wanna visualize that airway and just make sure they don't have any obvious obstructions because you would wanna clear those obstructions as quickly as possible as well. <clears throat> you don't want them choking. Um, so uh, yeah, so airway patency, NPA, OPA, most providers I think prefer the NPAs. They're a little more reliable. They, they don't uh, uh, fight your patient if they end up having a gag reflex or various different things. Um, and then a BVM, and then something to remember about your BVM, remember that's, that's technically a two person skill, right? To really be able to effectively ventilate a patient through a face mask, uh, you really need one person to hold a seal and one person to breathe. Um, <clears throat> if you're doing it as a, a single person, then you need to be at the head of that patient. Uh, 
uh, so that you can kind of pull that patient towards you and open that airway through the head tilt chin lift and be able to manage that CE grip needed to truly and effectively manage that seal. Moving right along, then we, get, we go to an eye gel if our patient doesn't have a gag reflex, if they're unconscious and they need something a little more definitive. I'll tell you that this is pretty much our uh, flagship airway anymore in a pre-hospital environment because it's so easy to place. It doesn't require a whole lot in regards to uh, securing it and making sure that the uh, airway is safe and secure. Um, <clears throat> if the eye gel is insufficient though, we can move up to an endotracheal tube, uh, which is a more definitive airway management mean. Um, and then uh, if that is not sufficient or we have trauma to the airway um, or various different things, maybe inhalation injury or something like that, we can move into a needle crike uh, and then finally a surgical crike. Um, and that's really that continuum of care. And obviously uh, something we want to think about is the, the least invasive I can do to manage the patient initially, the, the more likely they'll have a higher prognosis at discharge from hospital. Now we absolutely need to elevate to the requirement of the patient, but um, maybe we do something a little less invasive to try to, to promote the patient's uh, ventilatory effort on their own. <clears throat> okay. So that's airway. Airway is just patency and, you know, do you have the right pieces? Is it intact? Do you have a, have a lung, right? It hasn't been shot out of your chest or, um, you know, you don't have a hole from a penetrating injury in a car accident or something like that. Um, moving into respirations, we're going to talk a little bit more about ventilation. Now, the name of the game in ventilation is tidal volume, right? Um, and so that's going to be your respiratory rate times your, sorry, I said tidal volume. It's your respiratory rate times your tidal volume, which is minute volume. Minute volume is the name of the game. Um, <clears throat> and so when you initially come up, so you've done your massive hemorrhage sweep, you've checked the airway, made sure all the parts are there, then you're going to look and make sure that your patient is, is actually breathing, right? You look, listen, and feel, right? You can put your ear towards the patient's mouth and hear if they're ventilating. You're going to put your hand on their chest um, <clears throat> and see if you can see movement as well as if you can feel movement looking down at that hand. Um, additionally, uh, once you've done that, you're going to inspect that rib cage and chest area, the box right nose to the navel, uh, and you're going to check for that DCAT BTLS, right? The deformities, contusions, abrasions, burns, tenderness, lacerations, swelling, uh, all of that. <clears throat> and then uh, additionally, uh, as you guys probably do on all of your patients, you're going to get that provider impression uh, of their skin condition, right? Are they pink, warm, and dry, or are they pale, cool, diaphoretic? Are they sick or not sick, right? <clears throat> so, um, Remember that respirations is actually the effective ventilation and, and cellular respiration. If you have a patient, say a COPD patient that's air trapping, yes, they may have a, an appropriate or maybe even an elevated respiratory rate, but they don't have the tidal volume needed to support the functions of their body. Um, so respiratory rate doesn't necessarily equal um, effective ventilation. And then additionally, something to remember is that SpO2 does not qualify adequacy, right? Uh, SpO2 should only serve as an indication of something you already know. You should be able to look at your patient and tell whether they are oxygenating well or not, right? Um, we all are familiar with the signs and symptoms of hypoxia, right? Paleness, cyanosis, modeling of the skin, and then obviously uh, decreased mental status or level of consciousness. Um, <clears throat> So remember, SpO2 does not qualify adequacy. Just because you put a patient on, a, on an SpO2 and they read it 99 does not mean that they are ventilating or respirating appropriately. Uh, a good example of that's a carbon monoxide poisoning uh, where you'll have a high reading of SpO2 whether they, they are or not. <clears throat> okay, moving into that, uh, the, the waters get a little muddy between airway and respirations in regard to some of the, the, the um, preventable deaths, specifically being pneumothorax, right? Um, so in a pneumothorax, you actually have damage um, to tissue that causes air to get outside of the lung and in between the, the pleural space and the lung. And essentially, as that air gets out, it begins to collapse the lung. Um, <clears throat> now, that's damage to the airway, okay? Uh, but it causes insufficient ventilation or insufficient respirations because you lose the tidal volume of that lung as it collapses and you are no longer adequately supporting uh, ventilation in your patient. 
Now, <clears throat> in regards to trauma, one of the things that you're gonna come into contact a lot with, which is one of the preventable deaths, is a tension pneumothorax. Now, a tension pneumothorax is worse uh, than just, a, say, a simple pneumo, uh, because as the tension pneumo develops, it actually begins to put stress uh, on the heart and begins to collapse the heart as, as, the, as the tension increases. And it also uh, causes an increase in inner thoracic pressure, which begins to depress your, your inferior and superior vena cava, reducing your preload, right? <clears throat> Um, now, as that pressure builds up and it compresses everything, you lose circulation. And so if you can imagine, essentially what we have is we have a pressure that is obstructing the circulatory system. And so that's where we get the concept that tension pneumothorax is obstructive shock, right? Because it obstructs the perfusion. And if you can remember back to the, sh the shock slide, the shock is inadequate tissue perfusion. It is the the inability of the body to get the nutrients like oxygen and glucose to the cells, okay? Uh, additionally to that, you may have a sucking chest wound. Now, a sucking chest wound is different than a tension pneumo because the hole is significantly larger. In, in an issue when you have a tension pneumo, say you have somebody shot with a nine millimeter, most of that, uh, a nine millimeter round, most of that muscle tissue will close back up and it will self-occlude, which is one of the reasons why the pressure builds up. In a sucking chest wound, the hole actually becomes larger. And I think they say it has to be something like two thirds the size of your trachea or larger, about the size of a nickel. Um, and as that hole gets large, or if it's large, then you know air follows the path of least resistance. So as the patient inhales, uh, because of the larger hole on the side, the air is, it's easier for it to enter through the side than through the trachea. Uh, and the lung collapses and you get inadequate ventilation. That's where we place the occlusive dressing on the patient during the exhalation phase so that we can kind of extend those lungs out and get them as open as possible and then close that up so that the air doesn't go back in through the side and so we can breathe through the patient. Now, it's important to note that when you place that occlusive dressing that you're gonna want to watch for the development of a tension pneumo, and you may have to burp that occlusive dressing. So, um, yeah, so moving right along, chest seals, uh, you wanna use them in any penetrating trauma on the chest, right? Uh, actually, any penetrating trauma from the nose to the navel, anywhere in the box, front or back, right? Just throw a chest seal on it. It's going to control hemorrhage, and it's going to reduce the possibility of air getting into that uh, inner thoracic and inner, inner abdominal space. So, uh, obviously, you can use your actual chest seals, right? Like the high vents or, uh, say, a halo bandage or something like that. Um, <clears throat> additionally, though, you can innovate and adapt. Uh, you can use something like the uh, combo pads for your... Uh, AED or your uh, monitor defibrillator, whether it's LifePak, Zoll, or whatever. Um, and then two, don't forget, if you don't have anything, a gloved hand right on there is going to help seal that. And you can at least manage it and navigate it initially with that. Uh, so you may even take a glove and tape it on the patient. I don't know. It depends on the situation. So remember your chest seals. Remember to place them on holes in the box. Um, okay, uh, I think we're actually going to skip this break. We took one just a little bit earlier. We're going to move along. I think we'll take one here at about 1020. So, uh, so moving on to uh, circulation. All right, so now we're talking about the actual movement of blood in the body. Um, in circulation, um, when you, so you've gone through massive hemorrhage, airway, and respirations. When you're checking circulation, uh, you're basically doing another real quick head to toe sweep and you are, you know, you'll check any previous wounds that you identified in your blood sweep uh, and any interventions you may have placed, whether it be a tourniquet or uh, bandaging or whatever. Um, and then uh, again, you can perform that head to toe sweep. Um, but here you're making special notes to pay attention to, do I have PMS distally to the body, right? Do I have radial pulses? Do I have pedal pulses, right? Is my patient pink, warm, and dry? Or are they pale, cool, and diaphoretic, right? Um, <clears throat> that skin condition can tell you a lot. And remember, as we get to the end of this, it's going to tell you the most tactical indicators, the things that just scream, your patient is in shock, is altered mental status or de decreased level of consciousness and pale, cool diaphoresis, right? <clears throat> um, so yeah, navigate through all of that. Um, remember too, and this is something that I try to stress to providers all the time, and that's the idea that, that stable vitals do not equal not in shock, right? You can absolutely be in compensated shock. If you have a patient who has a GSW to the abdomen, 
and their blood pressure is, you know, 140 over 80, and they're maybe sitting at, you know, a heart rate of 105, um, and they're the GCS of 15, that doesn't mean your patient's not in shock. They may very well be in compensated shock. So you need to look at some of the additional signs and symptoms, diaphoresis, uh, respiratory complaints, um, you know, cyanosis, modeling of the skin, those kind of things, uh, because you may have lost some of the uh, volume needed to uh, perfuse that tissue, okay? Um, and then obviously, if you begin to have low vital signs, like the, those true symptoms of shock, the low blood pressure, the high heart rate, and the high respiratory rate, the compensated shock, right? That's where they're moving into compensated shock, and uh, you probably need to do a lot of things pretty quickly. So, uh, as you go down the body, obviously you're going to check pelvic fractures, open the book, close the book, make sure that you don't have any obvious injuries there. Uh, and then before you get to the back, uh, in a, in a high stress environment, remember this whole March algorithm takes, you know, two to three minutes, right? Uh, before you get to move the patient, think about, uh, checking that back and then having things prepped prior to movement of the patient. So you only have to move them once. An example of that may be if you have a, a front side, hole from a GSW and you suspect you're going to have a, a, a backside, prior to rolling the patient to inspect their back, get another chest seal available uh, so that when you roll, you inspect, it's there, slap it on, also have your backboard ready and you can roll the patient onto the backboard and then put them onto the cot and it's one kind of swift movement. <clears throat> um, obviously, as you roll them from side to side, make sure you're doing a quick uh, blood sweep of all the body. Um, and uh, Anytime you move the patient, remember to recheck any interventions. If you have a tourniquet set to the leg and you move the patient, that tourniquet may be moved in the sense that allows perfusion uh, to return to the wound, and you don't want that. So once you reposition your patient, secure them, uh, recheck those interventions, and make sure that you haven't uh, had something start to re-bleed. So uh, <clears throat> moving into hypovolemia, um, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Hypovolemia can be caused by a couple different things. We can have a lack of volume, right? Or uh, we can also have a, a, a change in the container, right? Uh, say like in a neurogenic shock style situation, uh, damage to the central nervous system cause global dilation. And essentially your container gets, container gets too big, the volume drops, you lose your preload and lose your afterload. <clears throat> um, in a trauma situation, if you've had massive external hemorrhage, then clearly you have lost the volume needed to perfuse the body. Um, and so in this situation, we're gonna wanna start to replace the fluids that are uh, lost. But one of the things, like I said earlier, that we've learned over time is that, you know, crystalloid solution can't support the perfusion of oxygen and glucose. It can only support hypo or volume pressure, right? Um, so essentially really what we wanna do is we wanna replace it with whole blood. The likelihood that we're going to be able to do that in the field is super, super low. Now, um, when we have uh, other options, we could do a, you know, a one to one to one uh, ratio of, of red blood cells, plasma, and platelets, um, and then it kind of goes down the list all the way to you know Hexton and Gristaloid being the lowest <clears throat> on the on the totem pole, right? And so really. When we think hypovolemia and trying to fix that, we have two things that we want to do. We do want to maintain perfusion, but I'm not concerned about maintaining a stable blood pressure. I just want to know that I'm perfusing the brain and the, and the essential organs. So, you know, 80 to 90 systolic and I'm, I'm pretty happy. Uh, additionally to that though, uh, for providers on scene, uh, you may want to be considering the administration. Actually, you should be considering the administration of TXA, right? Uh, uh, transdynamic acid, essentially uh, improving the body's ability to clot. Um, if you have that massive either external or internal hemorrhage, we want to stop that. And if we can promote the body's ability to uh, clot, then we will um, essentially help them stop bleeding, right? Um, you know, the dose that we use here is one gram uh, over 10 minutes. Um, now, uh, there's some... Uh, information out there that says two grams over 10 minutes. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if things move in that direction, but currently uh, we're doing the one gram in 10. Uh, something to note though, is you wanna give that TXA as early as possible, ideally within like 10 minutes of the injury if you can, uh, but at the very least, no greater than two to three hours, because as you begin to pass that two to three hours, you are now uh, causing risk for the patient to actually, uh, be it to, for it to be detrimental, so. Uh, so yeah, in hypovolemia, remember your, your goal is to support uh, perfusion. So you may need to start an IV or an IO. 
Uh, chances are, if your patient needs volume support, you're probably going to be starting an IO and not an IV, especially if they're in shock because you're going to be having a difficult time getting that IV if their body's clamped down. Because uh, remember, in shock, the body, as it compensates, uh, latches down that vasculature to try to improve the systemic vascular resistance and cardiac output. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, moving right along. Finally, finishing that up, we have got head injury, hypothermia, and hypovolemia, okay? Uh, so in head injury, really the things that I want you to be able to do is to be able to assess what is the possibility of head injury and then some correlating signs and symptoms. So uh, some of the big things you're gonna see in the, in the instances where your patients have a, a significant head injury, obviously we're gonna have altered mental status, right? Uh, we may potentially have poor PMS. Again, remember that uh, any damage to that central nervous system can cause neurogenic shock and, and global dilation. Um, <clears throat> we could have lack of consensual reflexes, uh, or, which is basically irregular uh, on unequal pupils, right? An irregular response. Obviously, if you have unequal or fixed dilated pupils, we can potentially have uh, an injury to the brain. <clears throat> um, any type of irregular breathing pattern, right? Um, you know, uh, if they are breathing agonally, if they have, say, like a uh, small respirations or something like that, you may potentially be looking at that. Um, then obviously rattle, raccoon signs or battle signs, right? Raccoon signs being dark circles around the eyes, uh, that indicating um, uh, a delayed sign of a basal or skull fracture, or of a skull fracture, and then um, battle signs being the, the belay, response of the uh, um, basal or skull fracture. <clears throat> and then Cushing's reflex, we're gonna talk about that in one of the next slides. Any type of abnormal flexion or extension, you know, posturing, positive Babinski reflex, those kind of things. Uh, and then obviously uh, amnesia, right? If somebody has repetitive questioning, there's a high likelihood that they have a concussion or various things. So uh, to talk about Cushing's, re Cushing's triad, really, or Cushing's reflex, <clears throat> I've got a slide for you here that hopefully will help you kind of remember this. And I think it's an important thing to drive home in regards to uh, trauma. And then additionally, it, it affects us in the kind of stroke algor algorithm as well. Um, <clears throat> and that is Cushing's triad in the presence of increased intracranial pressure. Uh, the body begins to measure that pressure essentially and say, okay, this is bad. I need to, I need to reduce this pressure. I need to slow this down. And so the response, the effect is for the pulse rate to decrease and the respiratory rate to decrease. Again, trying to reduce the response of the body and the pressure in the brain, right? Um, now you'll know that this is the case because the systolic blood pressure will still be supported, right? Uh, you'll probably even have maybe say a hypertensive blood pressure, right? Now providers can get into some, some troubled territory here because a lot of times somebody who has Cushing's triad is gonna present with a, a very low, if not extremely bradycardic heart rate, something say like 30, right? Maybe even 28. Um, and as providers, we wanna speed that up because we know that's too low. But what I want you to remember in this instance is what is the life threat of bradycardia? And that is uh, poor perfusion, right? And so if you have the presence of a, of a high blood pressure, do you have poor perfusion? No. Um, and, and it's easy to remember that increased inter intracranial pressure is increased systolic blood pressure and decreased pulse rate and respirations because it's exactly the opposite of shock, right? Which is a decreased blood pressure due to some type of hypo, hypovolemia, right? Or, um, you know, we talk about anaphylactic or neurogenic or those kind of things. You have a decrease in blood pressure and the body tries to compensate by increasing the pulse and increasing the respiration. So say you have a tachycardia at 120, you have tachypnea at say 35, but your blood pressure is 80 over 40. You know your patient's probably in shock versus the bradycardia at 30 and then the, the respiration say maybe at you know, eight to 12 and then a blood pressure of 180 over 100, okay? So um, I think this is a good stopping point here. Um, I think this would be a good place to do a break. Actually, I think I may jump ahead on them uh, if we can. And let's just go ahead and take five. Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah, that'll give me some time to prompt this. So um, one of the things we're going to do, we got a little survey question here. It'll allow me to interact with you a little bit. 
uh, and that is going to be posted uh, up on the on the chat, I believe. Um, go there, answer that question. It it, it relates to the um, uh, to the lecture that we've taught so far, uh, and we'll be able to pull that up and kind of talk about it and see what you guys are are thinking. So, okay, thank you, thank you. Oh, um, let me read you this question here. So. Uh, so in trauma, what are your immediate priorities of care? Uh, is it A, airway breathing or circulation? Is it B, respirations, bleeding, and oxygen? C, circulation, airway, and breathing? And then D, breathing, circulation, and airway. Guys, take a chance and vote on that, and we will get, after the break, we'll get it uh, pulled up here, and we'll talk about it. Okay. Uh, so while you guys are putting that in, uh, let's go ahead and pull up the, uh, the question here. So, um, so the question, again, is um, in trauma, what are your immediate priorities of care? And uh, the questions, or the answers, excuse me, are airway breathing, circulation, respirations, bleeding, and oxygen, circulation, airway, breathing, and then breathing, circulation, and airway. And then uh, we'll go ahead and pull up the responses here. Um, You'll notice that the responses were divided pretty well 50-50. Um, and that's an interesting topic that I think we should talk about for a second. Um, you know, throughout most of our training and everything that we do, we're always taught, consider your ABCs, right? Airway, breathing, circulation. Um, in regards to trauma, though, um, we have a different priority, right? Initially. Uh, it's not initially going to be airway. It's going to be circulation. So the correct answer is actually circulation, airway, breathing, okay? Uh, and I'll tell you why. So um, if you can remember, in a traumatic situation, um, very often you're going to have uh, the potential for massive external or even internal hemorrhage. Um, and so if we, if we go into that scenario, we say I have a patient who is you know, massively ex hemorrhaging from a, a lower leg amputation, right? I just use that because it's an easy illustration. Um, if we come to that patient and we prioritize as a single provider breathing for that patient, what's going to happen? The patient's going to continue to bleed out, right? And eventually, the patient will bleed out enough of the blood product that supports the perfusion of tissue that we can continue to ventilate that patient, ensure their airway is open, um, that they're breathing. Um, and it's not going to do a whole lot, right? What we have to do is we have to stop the massive external hemorrhage, um, whether that's through direct pressure or, um, you know, tourniquet use, bandaging, so on and so forth. Now, <clears throat> it's, it should be noted, and I think most of the time when people say my priorities are airway, a lot of times what they're thinking is that initial uh, head tilt chin lift, right? Something to prioritize that I have a patent airway, maybe not necessarily supporting ventilations like we talked about with respiration. Um, it's not entirely wrong to think about it that way, um, you know, and it wouldn't take but a few seconds to open an airway. Um, but if I am a single provider and I'm trying to prioritize uh, my care, I'm going to prioritize stopping the, mass external, the massive external hemorrhage over uh, you know, a patient's airway because I have to make sure that I'm supporting the perfusion of the oxygen that I'm trying to make sure that patient is getting. Now, obviously, we have some competing, uh, some issues that are competing for our attention there because they absolutely are both essential pieces and they both need to be managed in a timely fashion. Uh, if any of you have ever worked on a critical patient before, though, one of the things that you've probably experienced is that feeling of you have multiple life threats that need managed and uh, you're only one person, and you can only manage one thing at a time, right? Um, and so in that respect, we're gonna prioritize circulation to promote the perfusion of tissue, right, over oxygenation. Now, something you can add to that is to remember that as an adult patient, uh, your body can go a little bit longer in that kind of hypoxic environment than, uh, than say, maybe a pediatric can. And in that adult patient, uh, they may be able to go a little bit longer without the oxygenation, but they are absolutely not going to be able to go a long time with massive external hemorrhage. Now, uh, I think another good illustration of this point is if you've ever actually seen massive hemorrhage, especially, say, like from an arterial bleed, right? Uh, it can take, you know, less than three minutes, probably closer to two minutes uh, 
for an individual to hemorrhage out the entirety of the volume, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. Um, and, and potentially you've, you've reached that point where there is no return and the patient will uh, expire. So, so that's why we prioritize circulation over airway in a trauma scenario. Now that changes a little bit when we get into medical, uh, but we'll talk about that a little later. So, uh, okay, so moving on into the PowerPoint now, uh, we talked about the Cushing's triad, uh, increased intracranial pressure and how it's the opposite of shock. Um, now we're going to talk about hypothermia. Now, when, when we say hypothermia in, the, in, the, in regards to trauma, we're not talking about the true cold injury, right? Most of us, when we hear the word hypothermia, we think, uh, you know, excessively cold temperatures and damage to the tissue due to that, that cold or freezing temperature. And trauma, that's not what we're talking about. Um, just simply a, a few degrees of lost internal body temperature can reduce the body's ability to coagulate, okay? Um, and so anytime our patient gets cold, which is a, a high risk in shock, because as the person loses the volume of blood product, they lose their ability to maintain and internally regulate that temperature. Um, and so as their body gets cold, they lose their, their coagulation ability, and then the risk of external hemorrhage increases because they're not going to clot off. Um, there's little things that we can do that can drastically improve a patient's ability to manage that loss in temperature. Uh, things from as simple as putting a blanket over them or even just, you know, if you're in an ambulance or in a rescue truck on a fire department or even uh, if you're in a POV and you place them inside your vehicle, cranking up the heater inside to get it warm, right, and help try to maintain that internal body temperature. Um, and then too, you can also place, you know, um, like the military has the ready heat blankets or a lot of EMS and first responder agencies have the heat packs. Um, and if you're just some person walking down the road, you may even have some of those hot hands. Those are little things that we can place in those highly vascular areas, the armpits, the groin, um, you know, to, to promote that, that active warming, right? Um, and do what you got to do to improvise to get around that. Um, I will tell you that I think, and I see this uh, out in the field every single day, I think one of the areas that we as um, first responders kind of struggle with is the, the management of, of hypothermia in the presence of trauma. And the reason for that, I think, is because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's in the way, right? It, it prevents us from being able to access the patient, to be able to visualize the injuries, to be able to do our hands-on assessments, to start our IVs and give our medications and do the things that we need to do because, because it's inconvenient to continually wrap the patient up and then take them out and wrap them up. But it is something that I think if you're a little more mindful of, you can uh, promote a higher quality of prognosis for your patient long-term. So, uh, okay, so we're gonna kind of recap this as we talk about um, hypovolemia, and this correlates with the circulation section of the March algorithm. Um, and so what I want you to think about is how does your body react to blood loss, right? Um, and, and the answer really is it depends on how much you lose, right? So in the instance that you have uh, an average adult male, um, the average adult male carries about five liters of blood on them, right? <clears throat> That's normal, okay? Um, so if you lose half a liter, 500 mLs of blood, are you going to see a significant change in the, the physical signs and symptoms of the body? And the answer is probably not, right? You're, actually, you're not, right? This is equivalent of, of um, basically giving a unit of blood at a blood bank or something like that, right? <clears throat> um, your patient, your casualty is not going to die from that, right? Um, your heart rate, your vital signs, they're really not going to change from that. Uh, loss of blood. Now, at a liter of blood, um, your patient's going to maintain an alert mental status. Their radio pulse is still going to be strong, right? Um, their heart rate may start to increase a little bit here, right? Because we've lost enough volume that the, the heart's having to pick up a little bit of that slack. Um, and you may notice some uh, orthostatic hypotension here. As your patient stands, their blood pressure drops, but if they lay down, their blood pressures are normal. Um, respiratory rate's probably gonna be normal. There's not gonna be a whole lot of need to compensate because the blood or the body's still getting oxygenated. Um, again, your patient uh, or casualty or however you wanna look at it is not gonna die from this. Now, now we're at a, about a liter and a half or 15 ml, 1500 mLs. <clears throat> uh, this patient's gonna notice something's wrong. They're probably gonna be pretty anxious. Uh, they probably are gonna be pretty tired, maybe lethargic. Um, their heart rate is going to be elevated. 
Uh, their systolic blood pressure may be a little soft, right? Um, they're starting to show that, that uh, physiological sign of, of a loss of volume. Their respiratory rate is going to increase at this point because now they don't have the amount of blood volume product that they need to perfuse the body. Is the casualty going to die from this? Probably not. Now, you talk about prolonged um, um, hypovolemia, there could be potential for organ failure and various other things. Uh, so it's probably not, but it is something that does need to be managed. Now at, at two liters or 2000 mLs of blood loss, this is where your patient's really going to start to show those signs of shock, which is going to be altered mental status or decreased level of consciousness. They're going to be confused. They're going to be lethargic. They're probably going to be pretty weak. Uh, the heart rate is going to be significantly elevated. You're going to have a tachycardia. Uh, blood pressure is going to be markedly decreased. Respiratory rate is going to be elevated, right? And the casualty could potentially die from this blood loss. And especially when you talk about long-term organ injury, uh, it absolutely, the patient absolutely could. And then you can see where this is going. As we get into two and a half liters of blood volume, your patient's uh, um, going to be unconscious. They're not gonna have enough to support the, the needs of the body. Um, that radial pulse will probably be absent because we've lost enough volume now, we're hypotensive. Again, the heart rate markedly increased over the previous. Uh, systolic blood pressure continuing to go down, respiratory rate elevated. Uh, a patient who has lost 2,500 or more is probably going to die. Um, and so um, if you can remember from all of those things, one of the easiest signs and symptoms for us to see as providers is altered mental status, right? If our patient presents to us confused, lethargic, weak, just as a general state of confusion or altered mental status, um, <clears throat> the most efficient way to determine and suspect shock is going to be that altered mental status or that decreased level of consciousness. And then any type of abnormal presentation in radial pulse, um, and then the presence of, uh, say pale, cool, uh, diaphoretic skin. So remember that your tactical, best tactical indicators are going to be altered mental status and absent or, or, uh, uh weakened radial pulse. So, uh, so let's talk about pre-hospital management. So uh, something to remember, and we're going to talk about this a little bit at the end, is the, the, the continuum of care, the operational portion of that in which you are making decisions and providing patient care may dictate some of the decisions, right? Uh, in a pre-hospital environment, our goal is to get the patient to definitive care, right? right? The, the continuum of care that is going to result in the highest quality outcome at discharge from hospital the highest prognosis or, or most um, the highest quality of life after leaving the hospital right and so in a trauma scenario uh, what is that definitive care well that's going to be a level one trauma center right we want to go to a level one because not only do they have the resources needed ors surgical equipment various different things but as a level one trauma center um, they have the staff there ready waiting when you get there right um, <clears throat> They're going to need a trauma surgeon, right? Especially in a class one trauma, they're probably going to need someone to help do some restorative care, uh, stop massive hemorrhage, repair tissue injury, various different things. Uh, and then they're probably going to need, uh, well, they will need an ED and an OR most likely and long-term probably an ICU and then moving in long-term care, potentially uh, step down units, uh, rehabilitative care, learning how to walk again, various different things. So, uh, but initially, uh, obviously the first thing we want to do is we assess our patients, make sure we don't have a traumatic cardiac arrest, right? Is our patient responding and are they breathing? If they're not responding and they're not breathing, then I'm going to start CPR because I have a patient who's potentially in a cardiac arrest. Okay. Uh, that's the no, no go, right? No, if no normal breathing and no responsiveness, then start CPR. Um, if that's not the case, then uh, I'm going to go through that March algorithm. And again, the initial March algorithm is just like that, that rapid trauma assessment that you perform on your, uh, your trauma assessment for your NREMT, right? Um, <clears throat> and you do that head to go uh, DKIP BTLS while you're doing that assessment. Once you've gathered that information and stopped those uh, major life threats, um, you know, um, massive hemorrhage, uh, a, a compromise or obstructed airway, and then tension pneumo. If you've stopped all of that and you've supported, you know, the circulation and ventilation of the patient, then you're going to start getting ready to transport that patient. Uh, in order to do that, you want to do a TCD alert, right? You want to let the hospital know that you're coming so they can start to get all those resources 
uh, there in the room. Activate the, the trauma team. Make sure the trauma surgeon's in the room when you get in there, making sure they have all the staff needed and equipment needed. Um, you're going to obviously assess vitals for that, pa that patient. You're going to do full sets of vitals, right? Um, and you're going to monitor and treat that patient for shock, right? Um, we may consider IV access on this patient for a couple different reasons. We may consider it for hypovolemia support, uh, and then two, potentially just for the hospital for ease of, of uh, care once we transition over to the hospital care so they can start blood products and various different things. You may also want to start that IV in case you're going to administer TXA. Uh, and then as we do with all our patients, we want to reassess. Every chance we get, we want to reassess anything we've seen that we've done and make sure that something's not changing for our patient, right? Uh, and so that's pre-hospital management. Again, the, the real name of the game here is uh, assessment and identification of severe trauma and specifically those major life threats, uncontrolled massive hemorrhage, um, tension pneumo, and, and occluded or obstructed airway, compromised or obstructed airway. So, okay. Um, I don't, I think we're ahead on the break there as well. So we're going to move right along. Can you tell me when my break's going to be? Um, <clears throat> So that's trauma. Now we spend a lot of time in trauma because it kind of brings all these points together. Um, and so uh, as we move into stroke, STEMI, and then some of the, the, the um, emergent diagnoses, I want you to think about the concepts that we covered there and kind of how they apply. So when we talk about stroke. Um, you know, most people, uh, when you say stroke, they, they associate it with something along like this picture, right? Uh, you have a, a complete unilateral, unilateral paralysis or uh, a complete paralysis to one side of the body, right? <clears throat> There's a couple different things at play when we're dealing with patients who have strokes. And so the first thing I want you to think about is just the general anatomy of the body, right? So we have this uh, blood flow to the brain, right? And the blood flow gets to the brain through several different areas. We're just going to mention a couple here, um, such as the internal carotid artery, the vertebral artery that comes up through the vertebrae, the anterior cerebral artery or the ACA, and then the middle cerebral artery, the MCA. Those are all your major uh, uh, vessels that supply blood to the brain. Now, obviously, you have uh, branches of vasculature that branch off those main uh, passageways and get to uh, all those smaller areas of the brain. Um, <clears throat> it's important to think about this because anytime we have damage to the tissue, anytime there is breakdown of, of, of any type of tissue, brain tissue, cardiac tissue, musculoskeletal tissue, um, or even, you know, you talk about cellular death, a lot of times that is caused by inadequate perfusion, very similar to shock, right? Um, in the presence of stroke, um, we have two major types of strokes, right? And they, they both, through different uh, pathologies, cause a, uh, an obstruction or a, a failure of the, of the blood flow to the brain. And so, uh, we have, so we, like I said, we have two major types of stroke. We have ischemic stroke and we have hemorrhagic stroke, right? Um, I imagine many of you have heard that before. And as, as you look at this slide, you'll see it's pretty straightforward. In an ischemic stroke, we have uh, an occlusion or an obstruction of one of those veins or vasculature that we talked about. Um, <clears throat> now, most of the time, uh, you know, occlusions, obstructions, those kind of things are caused, um, you know, say maybe by a patient who has atrial fibrillation, right? And they have that, that high risk for forming blood clots. Um, and they throw a clot and it causes an occlusion. But then two, uh, just general, uh, artro I can never say this, arteriosclerosis, right? Which is that buildup of fatty cholesterol plaque within the arteries. And as it builds up and builds up and builds up, eventually you have an occlusion, okay? Now, once that occlusion occurs, everything that is downstream from that occlusion is going to be affected. Um, most of the time, um, it's going to be, and, and the picture above it kind of illustrates it. You can see that kind of blue affected area. Um, depending on where that obstruction is, if it's, if it's in a more major vasculature, it's going to cause a, a significantly larger area of the brain to be uh, affected versus if it made it into, say, some of that smaller brain off vasculature, and it'll affect a smaller portion of the brain. Now, <clears throat> similarly, in a hemorrhagic stroke, uh, what we essentially have is a weakened or 
um, um, damaged vasculature that ruptures, right? And so now we actually have essentially internal hemorrhage, right? Uh, within the brain, okay? And you can see that picture here that shows you that area of bleeding and that red spot to the brain. Now, this causes a different, uh, a little bit different effect in the sense that not only is everything that's downstream of that bleed now deprived of, of glucose and oxygen and the nutrients that it needs, but additionally, as that fluid leaks out of the vascular space, uh, it's increasing the pressure that is, um, that's within the intracranial area, right? The inside the skull. Uh, as that intracranial pressure increases, it's gonna start to put pressure against the brain and that, and that pressure alone can actually cause damage to brain tissue. Uh, and then additionally, obviously, you know, if you get significant pressure in the brain, you can actually have midline shift and cause significant trauma to the brain. Um, it's important to note here, we talked about Cushing's triad, talk about trauma. Um, you know, you may have a person who, who uh, lives chronically with high blood pressure um, and they develop aneurysms um, and those aneurysms can rupture and cause these hemorrhagic strokes. Uh, additionally, you could also have somebody, maybe they have an aneurysm, maybe they don't, but they say have AFib, they're chronically on blood thinners uh, and they have a fall in the shower, they're elderly, their connective tissue is kind of not as strong as it used to be. They can have a rupture uh, in the vasculature to the brain and again bleed out. As that pressure increases within that intracranial space, the, uh, you'll start to see that Cushing's triad reflex, right? The pressure increases, blood pressure, uh, heart rate drops, blood pressure still elevated, respiratory rate drops, right? <clears throat> Opposite of shock. Um, so, so like we said here, common causes or trauma, AFib throwing blood clots, atherosclerosis, those kind of things. Um, uh, depending on where the vasculature is, if it's, if it's major vasculature, you may see that significant presentation of unilateral paralysis, aphasia or agnosia. Um, you may even see uh, just a complete altered mental state. Uh, however, if it gets down into some of those smaller vasculatures that, that only supply blood to very specific, very small portions of the brain, uh, you may only see, uh, see minor uh, effects. Um, you may only see, you know, a, a patient may present to you normal, but every now and again, they just say something that's just a little off and it doesn't make sense. And it's because it's one of those smaller vessel occlusions versus say, if you got one um, down at the, the base of the brain, like say in the, the vertebral artery or the carotid artery, one of those that supplies blood flow to say the brainstem, that's going to be significantly, actually it's going to be really, really bad, right? Because your brainstem is responsible for regulating being alive, right? Um, <clears throat> So, uh, so yeah, so that's what's going on with stroke. Now, they consider this time critical diagnosis because there's, there's two things that we need to do very quickly and they both result in reperfusion of that brain tissue. What we know is that after about three minutes, the brain um, begins to uh, suffer damage from that lack of perfusion, right? Um, and so it'll start to malfunction. Um, so we wanna reperfuse that. Now in a, uh, in a ischemic stroke, we can do that through the use of administering TPA. Um, there's some, uh, there's some, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, there's some certain requirements that patients have to meet in order to, to be qualified to, to be given TPA. Uh, some of its age, some of its time of onset. That's why onset's a really big, time, big thing, big piece of information to get when you're dealing with your patients. Uh, who are potentially suffering from a stroke. So you can know when is my onset. Um, and the reason they care about that is, you know, if it's been a significant amount of time since onset, then the damage has probably already occurred and it's irreversible. However, if I have a patient who had an acute onset change, then maybe if we can reperfuse that quickly, uh, we can improve the patient's neurological outcome, right? Um, in regards to the hemorrhagic stroke, it's going to be a little bit different. And the question is, is the patient... Um, is the bleed operable, right? Is it something where they can go in and relieve that pressure, um, you know, evacuate the, the, the clot or whatever it may be. Um, so, uh, yeah, so those are your kind of the pathology between your two types of strokes. Um, when we talk about um, the pre-hospital care, uh, most of us are very familiar with um, the um, 
the act fast algorithm, right? The Cincinnati stroke scale, which is face, arm, speech, and time, which the, the thing to remember about the Cincinnati stroke scale is that it is designed to detect presence of. It doesn't do anything about severity. It just says, is the patient stroking or are they not? It's pass fail, right? Uh, and so you, met, you look at that face, you see, do they have uh, an equal smile or do they have a, say, a facial droop? Um, you have them hold their arms up. Does one significantly drift? Um, you ask them to talk. Are they able to speak clearly? Are their words muffled? Are they confused? And then time is get that onset time. Um, if you can look at this next one, though, this is one that we use here, which is the, uh, the rapid arterial occlusion evaluation uh, scale. Um, and this actually detects the severity of. And if you look closely at this, um, at the way that this evaluation is done, it's essentially a Cincinnati stroke scale, but on steroids, right? What you're doing is you're taking the face, arm, speech, and time, and you're giving it a, a numerical value to associate with the severity of the presence of that sign or symptom. So for example, with facial palsy, uh, is it absent? You don't have it. Is it mild? Like, yeah, they could potentially have some facial droop. Or is it clearly obvious, right? Like this patient has complete unilateral paralysis to the left side of the face. Um, that would be a two, right? Zero, one, or two. And you go through arm, leg, motor function, all that stuff is all the same. Now, the only one that's different is the head gaze or deviation. And in the presence of head gaze or deviation, it's really, is it present or is it not? So you either get a zero or a one. Um, and that number that you gather doing off this assessment uh, will give you kind of the severity of the stroke, like how bad is it? Um, and so they say, uh, as you can see on the screen there, if, if the race scale is a five or greater, the patient probably has a large vessel occlusion. You probably have an occlusion that is uh, in one of those more main arteries supplying blood to the, to the brain. Um, whereas if the number is smaller, you may have a smaller vessel occlusion that won't result in as significant a, a neurological deficit. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the race evaluation, uh, I recommend, you know, it's online. You can access it pretty much anywhere. Um, get familiar with it. It's something that's very, very beneficial to you. Um, so, um, moving right along, uh, we're going to move into, uh, heart attacks. Okay. So similar to how strokes work, um, the heart, um, has vasculature that supplies, um, blood both to the heart and to the body. And so we're going to just do a little bit of review here. Um, so if you guys can remember the anatomy of the heart, right? Um, you know, the blood flow is supplied through the superior and inferior vena cava, through the right atrium, to the right ventricle, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, you guys should remember that from anatomy and physiology class. <clears throat> um, the thing to remember is that as the blood exits the uh, left side of the heart, before any blood gets out to the body, there are branches that come back and perfuse the heart. The vasculature that comes off that left side of the heart and goes down the heart is called the coronary arteries, right? You guys have probably heard that, coronary arteries. A lot of times people hear the, the term coronary artery disease, right? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> um, another thing that I, another point I want to remind you here as we look at this uh, anatomy of the heart is remember that the left ventricle, right, is the, is the, uh, it's the larger portion of the heart, and it's really the the powerhouse of the heart. And, and essentially, if you were to rule what what valve or ventricle or atria, what what area of the heart is really pumping blood to the body, it's the left ventricle. Um, <clears throat> and there, uh, when we talk about the coronary arteries, there is a significant amount of blood flow supplied to that that left ventricle. Um, so. Going into the coronary arteries, um, this is what you're looking at here. So essentially you have those branches that come off uh, the left side of the top of the heart there, right proximal to the heart. Um, and so you've got your right coronary artery, your left main coronary artery, left anterior descending, your circumflex artery, all that stuff, obtuse marginal septal, um, and going all the way down into the bottom of the heart. Now, all of this vasculature is responsible for, again, just like in trauma, just like in stroke, uh, 
All this vasculature is responsible for bringing the nutrients to the tissue that it needs, the oxygen, the glucose, and so on, right? Um, and so if there's any damage or any occlusion that happens within that vasculature, um, you are going to have damage to the tissue. Now, something to note about cardiac tissue is it's, it's, a, it's a lot different than most of the other muscle tissue that you come into contact with in the rest of your body. Uh, one of the things very specific to cardiac tissue, though, is that it never regenerates. Once damage is done to the tissue, um, it, it's done. It's completely damaged, right? Um, and it won't come back. And it's important to note that that damaged tissue or dead tissue cannot do its job. Um, <clears throat> and so if you think about all the tissue that surrounds all the muscle that comprises the heart, each piece of, of tissue, if you will, is responsible for some portion of that that drive, that pump, right? <clears throat> and if we have damage to that, then we have a decreased efficiency in the heart's ability to pump blood, right? There's a whole lot of stuff you can look into in regards to, you know, ejection fraction and cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance versus cardiac output, resulting in blood pressure, all that stuff. We're not gonna talk about that, but <clears throat> what I do wanna drive home is uh, this idea of a, a bleed or a block in any, in any of this area results in cardiac tissue death, okay? And so uh, I'll, I'll show you another picture here, and this will kind of illustrate what a blockage does in the presence of, uh, say, an MI, okay? So, so here we go. Um, if you can remember back to the stroke uh, picture, it's, it's very similar to this, right? It's just the vasculature that covers the brain that gets the the buildup of plaque or the, the blood clot that breaks free and gets into the vasculature and occludes the vein. Here, again, you're seeing different variations of blockages within those coronary arteries. Uh, obviously, we know this is coronary artery disease, um, can be caused by lots of different things, diet, uh, health concerns, all that kind of stuff. Um, but as these blockages build up, the efficiency of the body's ability to deliver the oxygen and glucose and the nutrients it needs to the cardiac tissue decreases. Um, <clears throat> and as the, uh, as, the, as the vasculature gets blocked, uh, that tissue is going to become ischemic, right? And if we can remember from an ischemic stroke, uh, the ischemia is, a, is tissue that is hypoxic, right? It lacks the oxygen um, to be able to uh, effectively do its job right? Um, <clears throat> so um, the, uh, lost my train of thought there. So, okay. So, um, so we want to prevent blockages in the name of the game. Again, just like in, in trauma and in um, uh, STEMI or stroke, the name of the game is perfusion, right? We want to re-perfuse the body. So let's talk about what is definitive care for this patient, right? And so definitive care is going to be something um, like a cath lab, right? It's not going to be like a cath lab. It will be a cath lab with a cardiologist, uh, someone who can do some imaging to see where are these blockages occurring. Um, you know, uh, what can we do? Can we place a stent? Uh, do we need to do open heart surgery? Maybe do a bypass graft, something like that, right? A cabbage coronary artery bypass graft uh, so that we can reperfuse that cardiac tissue. Now, the reason, again, that this is a time critical diagnosis, just like stroke and just like trauma is because the longer that that tissue goes without that perfusion, the more damage that occurs to the tissue. And like I said earlier, uh, cardiac tissue it does not regenerate, okay? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, STEMI and non-STEMI here in just a second. Um, but before we get into that, uh, I want to, we're going to go ahead and take a break. Um, really quick though, I think uh, Brandon's going to pull up our next survey question here and put it up on the board. And as soon as he puts it up on the board, I'll read it to you here. Um, and um, so, uh, and then we'll, we're going to take a 10 minute break this time. So, um, um, so yeah, uh, so while he's getting that pulled up on the board, uh, just remember that, so the name of the game of everything we do is perfusion. Okay. All right. So we're up here on the board now. Um, so here's your question uh, for the survey to, for our break too. What? are the time critical diagnoses recognized in the Southwest Missouri region? This is a multiple choice. You can choose as many as you want. Uh, the options are stroke, STEMI, sepsis, trauma, shock, and cardiac arrest. 
Uh, choose the ones that you think are correct, and when we get back from break, we'll go over it. Thanks, guys, and enjoy your break. All right, everybody, coming back from that 10-minute break here. We're going to come back with a certs survey. Um, so the question we asked before the break was, what are the time-critical diagnoses recognized in the southwest Missouri region? Um, and you add a couple different options here, stroke, STEMI, sepsis, trauma, shock, and cardiac arrest. And we'll get the uh, responses pulled up here, and you guys can see where you guys voted. So it uh, looks like we have four for stroke, four for STEMI, and four for trauma, and then we had an additional one for cardiac arrest. Uh, so uh, as a whole, you guys are correct. Uh, stroke, STEMI, and trauma are the top three um, uh, time critical diagnoses re recognized by the Southwest Missouri area, as well as the, I think the state in general. Um, cardiac arrest uh, arguably is time critical. Um, however, uh, it is um, more of an emergent diagnosis and it doesn't quite have the time critical support system needed to manage it like the uh, trauma, stroke, and sepsis. Trauma, stroke, and sepsis have a very specific um, uh, treatment modality that if we can initiate early on will allow us to um, really help that patient get a high quality outcome at discharge from hospital. Um, so uh, we're gonna go back to the, the PowerPoint here and we're gonna look at the, uh, the myocardial infarction or the more specifically the STEMI side of the um, uh, time critical diagnosis. So in a, in a STEMI, what we have is, as you see here on this slide, you have a complete blockage, or maybe not necessarily complete, but you have a blockage of blood flow to the cardiac tissue. Uh, and as the nutrient delivery is reduced to that area of the heart, you begin to have malfunction of the cardiac tissue. Uh, and as it becomes ischemic, uh, that patient will begin to experience pain uh, as that tissue dies off. Now, uh, if we have an occlusion in one of the larger vessels, um, we're going to see a pretty significant change uh, in the patient's 12 lead, okay? And so uh, we'll progress on to this next slide here. And what you see is a normal ECG rhythm on the top, and then you see a, the representation of a STEMI below, okay? So uh, on the top rhythm, you'll notice that in a normal QRS complex, um, you're gonna have your P wave, your QRS complex, and then your T wave, and then it proceeds on to the next beat. Um, that segment that it points to called the ST segment, it starts from the J point, which is the bottom of that kind of QRS complex. And it starts from that J point and goes to where the beginning of the T wave, uh, where it starts, and that's the ST segment. And uh, during an, an ST elevated MI, or a STEMI, right, S-T-E-M-I, right, um, the ST segment elevates uh, as a result of cardiac ischemia. And so if you can think about this, your QRS complex is, is a representation of, of the amount of amplitude over time, right? And so when we see that ST elevation, we see that it's requiring more amplitude longer in order for that uh, elect electricity to be delivered and cause the appropriate uh, depolarization and repolarization of the cardiac tissue. Uh, you may also see uh, ST depression in, in, um, in contiguous leads uh, uh, or reciprocal changes, I should say, um, secondary to the cardiac ischemia. Um, <clears throat> reciprocal changes may not always be present, uh, but if you have a significant um, MI uh, that, you know, say it's a tombstone level MI that's happened acutely, you've had a complete occlusion of a, of a main artery, say like the, the LAD, the left anterior descending, uh, which is what they would call a widow maker, you may see some pretty significant uh, reciprocal changes. Uh, but again, so amplitude over time, and it's showing that it's taking that electricity longer to diffuse across that uh, cardiac tissue to cause the result of the heartbeat, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, what does this look like in an actual 12 lead? We'll give you an example here. Uh, so this is just a 12 lead that I downloaded off the internet that uh, some education site had as a representation of what is a uh, 
stimmy. Okay. <clears throat> and so, uh, when you look at this, I think this one's pretty obvious as to where the elevation is. Um, clearly, uh, we've got elevation in leads three, four, five, and six. Um, questionably, we also have what appears to be one to two millimeters of elevation in leads one, two, um, and potentially ABF. Uh, and then obviously, you got some depression in AVR, but we really kind of throw that out. Long story short, this is pretty clearly an MI, right, or an ST elevated MI. So, um, what you have is cardiac ischemia that has come on acutely. Um, again, the name of the game here is to reperfuse that cardiac tissue. Um, in order to do that, we're going to do a couple different things in the field. Again, the name of the game here for us in a pre hospital environment is assessment and identification, right? Um, Back on the, on the board here, we've got that 12 lead. So like I was saying, you've got an, uh, an ST elevated MI, which is your STEMI, S-T-E-M-I, right? ST elevated MI. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna do a couple things uh, initially in our patient care. One is going to be assessment and identification, right? Um, so we need to think about how is that patient going to present? Um, when we talk about shock, your patients most likely, if they're suffering a severe uh, MI, especially in the case of a STEMI, they're probably going to be suffering from uh, or potentially be suffering from cardiogenic shock, right? Um, and so as the damage to the cardiac tissue occurs, your heart's ability to pump efficiently and effectively decreases. And as it decreases, your cardiac output decreases. Uh, as the cardiac output decreases, just like in a hydraulic system, if you lose the stuff coming out, you lose the stuff coming in. Uh, and so this can devolve. Also, as we um, cause damage to that cardiac tissue and it gets more and more irritated, the possibility of that patient going into a dysrhythmia such as ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation uh, significantly increases. Okay, um, And so we want to do a couple things really quick. We want to assess and identify, and then one of our top priorities is, is if the patient does not have an allergy to it, we want to give them aspirin. Now, I think most 911 systems actually incorporate that into uh, the dispatching system when the call takers are speaking with the patients or the patient's family on the phone to initiate that care. Also, first responders, uh, fire departments, people who are initially on scene are really good about having the patient administer aspirin uh, themselves or even having aspirin for them to deliver to the patient or treat the patient with. We want to do that because the idea is we want to, you know, you'll always hear people say you want to make the blood slippery, right? Really what you're trying to do is you're just trying to reduce the body's ability to clot uh, so that you can reduce the development or the further exacerbation of that blockage. Um, uh, in the instance that your patient is complaining of an acute onset chest pain, you may also want to give nitro. Um, and uh, if you're going to do that, though, you're going to have to have some other things in line, right? Because nitro, one, we know that one of the side effects of nitro is, is a drop in blood pressure, right? So we want to make sure that we can support that if we're going to administer it. Um, and so uh, we want to start our IV, potentially have a, a fluid set up and ready to go should we need to support um, the uh, perfusion during that time that the blood pressure is low. Um, again, the nitro being a, a tool that we can use to help treat the, um, the pain. Uh, now, depending on the department you're with, uh, the organization you operate with, you may have other treatment options. Um, you know, there's the Mona algorithm. Some people treat with fentanyl or those kind of things. You'll have to refer to whatever your protocols are as to how you navigate treating that. <clears throat> um, but uh, so pre-hospital management, what do we do? Well, like I said, we want to we want to assess and identify. And in order to do that, we need to do a couple things, right? Uh, you guys are probably pretty familiar with your OPQRST, right? Onset, provocation, quality, uh, you know, radiation, severity, and time. Um, really what you're trying to do is you're trying to get an idea of when did this event start? How severe is it? And then some of that information is going to help you kind of navigate that differential diagnosis of is this a cardiac related chest pain or is it related to something else? Um, <clears throat> moving right along, um, we're going to get four leads and 12 leads, right? And in the four leads and 12 leads, hopefully we'll start to see a little bit clearer picture of whether or not we have an ST elevated MI. Um, now, your patient could be suffering from a heart attack and not have ST elevation. 
And there's a couple different ways that the pathology of that works. Um, really, as you think about it though, a non-STEMI, it's, it's less rare than, or sorry, less rare. It's more rare than a, um, than a STEMI. And it's, it's closer to like an unstable angina, right? What we probably have is somebody with coronary artery disease who has a blockage in some of those peripheral vasculatures that only supply blood to very specific parts of the heart. Uh, again, the, the, the ischemic tissue causes pain, um, but if you can remember how a 12 lead works, you're essentially shooting single pictures through the heart. And if we have a small area of the heart affected, we may not see that prominent ST elevation that you would see if you say have like a right cir circumflex or a LAD or you know um, one of those other main arteries occluded. Um, <clears throat> so we wanna get that four lead and that 12 lead early on to help us determine is it ST elevation MI or not. Um, we also wanna get a blood pressure because that's gonna help dictate some of the decisions we make in regards to nitro and other medications we, we give, whether or not we do fluid support or something like that. Um, <clears throat> we wanna monitor vitals, right? The likelihood that a patient having an MI can deteriorate is high, right? Uh, you have very uh, irritated cardiac tissue. You um, obviously have cardiac tissue that's dying. We know that the uh, heart has a high risk for, for devolving into a cardiac dysrhythmia, such as um, uh, ventricular, ventricular fibrillation or VTAC. Uh, so we want to monitor, we do want to do a TCD alert. Again, the earlier we can identify this closest to when the event occurs, the more likely that we can get that patient to definitive care and, and promote a positive discharge uh, or a positive outcome at discharge from hospital. And so when we think about what is definitive care, right? We talked about that. It's that, that culminative conclusive care, right? And so in the, in the event of a STEMI, right, we know we need a cath lab potentially. We know we need um, a cardiologist. We may have to do open heart surgery and do a bypass graft or, you know, something like that. <clears throat> and if that's the case, then we need to get them to the people that can do that. And so definitive care for a STEMI is going to be a level one STEMI center, right? Uh, that's going to be a hospital that has a cath lab that is equipped to receive patients and staff that is on site uh able to treat that patient immediately okay um in those um uh, healthcare systems a lot of times uh, when you bring the patients in you'll usually just meet a doctor at the door they do a quick assessment and you go straight on down to cath lab where they can intervene and do it i think what they call that is interventional cardiology um <clears throat> and so uh do that TCD alert so that they can activate that cath lab and get all that stuff set up. And then obviously like we've, you know, you're starting to notice a theme here. You want to monitor and treat for shock. Again, this patient has a high risk of devolving into cardiogenic shock, uh, which does result in the same thing an inadequate tissue perfusion. Okay. Um, we talked about the administration of aspirin and nitro. Um, and then, like I said, definitive care, level one STEMI center, cath lab, cardiologist. Uh, and then when we think longer term care, uh, probably a CVICU, until they can stabilize that patient uh, and then step down units and probably rehabilitation centers um, where they can start to rehab their activity level back and kind of slowly get back to normal functions. All right, so now we're gonna talk about sepsis. Now at this point, we've officially concluded the, the recognized time critical diagnoses, okay? which is trauma, stroke, uh, and STEMI. Now in trauma, stroke, and STEMI, again, the, the name of the game is perfusion. We wanna support blood flow to the tissue, and we can do that through lots of different ways. As we move into these emergent diagnoses, these are things that we're gonna come into contact with a lot in the field that is gonna require a lot from us initially and does have a little bit of a time-sensitive manner. Now, uh, some hospitals, especially in regards to sepsis, may have time-critical uh, protocols in which they manage these diagnoses. They're just not nationally or state recognized as time critical diagnoses. And so when we talk about sepsis, and I'm not going to get crazy into the pathophysiology of this, but, but, and there's plenty of education out there, free education on YouTube and other places where you can really learn the pathology and pathophysiology of, of the disease. Um, but the, the lay terms that I want you to understand is essentially you have uh, an infection somewhere in the body, right? 
Um, this could be anything from pneumonia in the lungs or potentially, you know, cellulitis in a patient's leg, um, maybe a UTI, something like that, right? <clears throat> and as that, as that infection develops, um, it can uh, devolve into a situation where it gets into the bloodstream. Now, along with that, if you have a patient who develops multiple infections, um, you know, say the the bed-bound patient or the nursing home patient who isn't very active, who has an underlying pneumonia and they develop a UTI and then they happen to cut their leg on a wheelchair and they develop cellulitis. Now we have you know, three different infections working against the body and that infection can devolve and get into the bloodstream. Now, as the infection gets into the bloodstream, there's a lot of stuff that happens. Um, uh, one of the biggest things is obviously your body wants to fight this infection and in order to do that it's going to release a bunch of white blood cells and normally when we fight infections it's in the the uh, extravascular space right outside of the vasculature it's in the the tissue of the body and in order for white blood cells to get from the vasculature into the tissue they've got to do a couple things they've got to they've got to you know, stretch out, they've got to, to, to open up and create holes for them to get out of the vasculature so they create leakiness. And they're also gonna, gonna dilate the vessels to stretch it out. You get this increased um, vascular dilation throughout the body or wherever the infection is so that they can get through it. <clears throat> now, as that happens, um, the infection also can get out. Um, the, and not to get crazy into the details of it, but you know, as the white blood cells, uh, begin to attack the bacteria. One of the side effects is it can actually cause damage to the vascular tissue. Uh, as that starts to devolve and it starts breaking down and causing damage to the, to the vasculature, obviously your body knows that holes in the vasculature is bad. And so it's gonna start trying to um, plug those holes with coagulation factors. And as it plugs those holes, uh, eventually, depending on how severe the sepsis is, how, how systemic, right? When you're going to talk about that, the, the, when the uh, infection gets into the bloodstream, it becomes systemic, right? It, it's being perfused throughout your entire body. That infection is being carried to all your organs, to your heart, to your brain, to everything. And as the infection grows and the white blood cells struggle to keep up with fighting this infection, you're going to have, like I said, that damage to the vascular tissue as it's just attacking everything. The body then begins to try to plug those holes and starts to run out of those coagulation factors. This is where we're starting to develop into septic shock, right? We've had that systemic vasodilation, right? Um, we've got increased uh, um, leakiness into the vasculature. We've got increased um, um, white blood cell count, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> well, as you run out of coagulation factors, these things are not gonna get completed, the clots aren't, and they're gonna start to break off and float around in the blood system, which you guys, if, you, if you're familiar with that, that's disseminated intervascular coagulation, uh, which is a very, very bad thing. And along with that, when we talk about the damage to the vasculature, you, you gotta remember that as that blood goes through all the organs, it's also gonna go through the lungs. And if you can remember, the lungs are highly vascularized. They, they have a lot of vasculature that is responsible for causing that cellular respiration, the diffusion of oxygen, and carbon dioxide across the, the membranes to you know, inhale oxygen, exhale CO2. Well, that tissue then begins to get damaged as well. And as the lung tissue begins to get damaged, you start to devolve into ARDS or um, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And when your patient moves into that DIC and the ARDS um, uh, diagnoses, uh, your, your risk of mortality significantly increases, okay? Um, and so, uh, that's why it's super essential that we're able to identify sepsis early because when our patient becomes septic, the initial signs and symptoms may only be, um, you know, uh, increased temperature, right? Because we have an infection, um, maybe you may have an increased heart rate, but you may not, you may be sitting right on the, on the tachycardia line, right at 100. And you may not even have like the stereotypical hypotension that's usually associated with sepsis. You may just have soft blood pressure, say 100 over 60 or something. Um, you know, which if you're dealing with an, a, you know, a, a five foot tall, 80 year old woman may not seem that abnormal. Um, <clears throat> We need to be able to identify that early though, because if we can identify sepsis early, 
and treat it quickly, then we can prevent it from devolving into septic shock. Once we progress into septic shock and into DIC and ARDS, uh, we are way behind the game and, and it becomes very difficult to combat the systemic problems that we face, uh, which is why the mortality, in, mortality rate increases with uh, the patients that progress into septic shock. So we want to identify it early and there's a couple ways that we can do that. So uh, when we talk about identifying sepsis, there's things that I want you to remember. They're called the four T's of sepsis, right? So the first one, is tachypnea, right? <clears throat> so uh, that's a fast respiratory rate, tachypnea, right? Tachypnea. <laughs> um, so that's going to be a fast respiratory rate. Tachycardia, right? That's going to be a fast heart rate or an elevated heart rate. Now it's important to remember uh, patients sit at different um, uh, respiratory rates and, and heart rates um, as individuals. So, so it may be you need to consider, is it fast for that patient? For example, if you have an avid runner and their heart rate is normally 50 and they're up in the 80s, then that's significantly elevated. But you may have a fairly unhealthy, non-compliant uh, patient who normally sits at 80 and they're only at 100 or 110, maybe, I don't know. So, um, so first T, tachypnea, second T, tachycardia, and then the third T is temperature, okay? So one of the initial signs of sepsis is elevated temperature, right? That response to, that immune response to the infection. Now, the thing to remember, though, is that as sepsis progresses, um, and especially as it develops into shock, if you can remember, one of the signs and symptoms of shock is pale, cool diaphoresis. As the body begins to struggle oxygenating and, and perfusing glucose and getting the blood flow to the tissue, um, and especially when you think about that global dilation, the blood flow is not being carried out. Just like um, in shock, when, when you have a, a hypovolemia, the body begins to struggle to be able to maintain and regulate that internal temperature. And so a later sign moving into septic shock of sepsis is cool skin, pale cool skin. Um, so first T is tachypnea, second key is tachycardia, third T is temperature, right? And then the fourth T is going to be trend relevant data, right? You have to watch your patients. It's important to get an initial um, baseline set of vitals uh, for your patient and then to continually reassess your patient and trend that information. Are things getting better? Are they getting worse? Okay. You may have a patient who just has a minor infection. You may have a patient who has a significant infection that's developing into sepsis and potentially moving into septic shock. And again, the, the point that I want to reiterate with sepsis and why we consider it an emergent diagnosis is because early identification of sepsis is essential, right? We, um, we want to ensure that we catch it early because then we can start, you know, fluid support and aggressive antibiotics to begin to fight that infection and we can, we can, nip it off in the bud before the uh before it devolves into um septic shock so all right <clears throat> so moving on talk about pre-hospital management obviously the the theme you're noticing here the initial is going to be assessment and identification um, so this again is going to be a patient that presents with warm skin tachypnea tachycardia temperature and then another thing to keep in mind is Anytime you have an infection, you have a high likelihood of altered mental status or decreased level of consciousness, okay? Um, vitals, uh, you obviously want to gather a full set of vitals, um, you know, and an, an essential vital in, in identifying sepsis is a temperature. Um, so having a thermometer on your unit or keeping a thermometer in your go bag, whatever it is that you use, um, is important. Now, it may not be as important in managing, say, those emergent life threats like we were talking about with trauma um, or stroke or sepsis, but it absolutely is important in identifying, sorry, trauma, stroke, or um, STEMI, but it is important and essential in identifying sepsis, which needs to be treated quickly. Um, we want to consider IV access because we know that definitive care is going to include antibiotics and fluid boluses. And that's something that we can go ahead and get started 
um, make sure that the, the transfer of care is uh, quick, easy, and efficient. So uh, medication, something that we may want to consider is some type of vasopressor. Uh, here we use push dose epi. Uh, as that patient begins to become hypotensive and, and they have that that uh, that systemic vasodilation uh, using a push dose epi to help kind of contract or, or whatever your vasopressor may be to, to kind of contract the vasculature and improve that systemic vascular resistance, improving blood pressure is what we want to do to help perfuse. Because again, uh, in this instance, when we talk about hypovolemic shock, uh, when the patient pr progresses into septic shock, they're essentially moving into something very similar to uh, hypovolemic shock, right? Um, we've had that that systemic, uh, that global dilation. And um, as the dilation occurs, our, our cylinder gets bigger. And as the cylinder gets bigger, we lose our preload. And we've talked about this before, we lose our preload, we lose our afterload. Um, <clears throat> so um, we definitely want to consider some type of vasopressor to support if our patient's hypotensive. And we talked about this, uh, definitive care for a patient who is septic is going to be a, a hospital with an emergency room, an ED physician that can order the right labs and antibiotics and supportive care. Uh, they're probably, well, they will need uh, fluid support and then aggressive uh, antibiotic delivery. Uh, and then most likely a septic patient will end up in an ICU while they work to fight the infection uh, and then potentially a step down unit, maybe, maybe a rehab unit, depending on the severity of their sepsis. Um, it's important to note that depending on the nature of the infections, the, the healthcare continuum may change for the individual. For example, if you have a patient that develops sepsis um, uh, and say they had a, uh, a cut on their leg, you know, rather than having cellulitis, they may have gotten staph in their leg and then have an underlying pneumonia and UTI. As that staph uh, works through the tissue, um, you know, that patient, depending on the severity of the infection and how far it's spread, may end up having significant amount of fatty tissue and other things uh, amputated from the leg because they can't effectively fight the infection. Um, so there's a lot of kind of variables that go at play there with the long-term care. It just kind of depends on the nature of your patient and the differentials that you're working with. So uh, we got about five more minutes until a break here. So... Um, we're going to talk about um, OB emergencies. So uh, in OB emergencies, there's a, there's a lot of things at play. And we're kind of going to talk about the immediate life threats. Um, when you go into and you actually attend, you know, OB classes and, and OB emergency classes that talk about the pathophysiology in depth, um, there's other things at play. We're going to kind of talk about the, the major life threats and, and pre-hospital management of those major life threats. Now, I'll tell you, the most significant thing you need to watch for in dealing with uh, a patient in a potential OB emergency is massive hemorrhage, okay? Um, and this is most likely an internal massive hemorrhage. It could potentially be external hemorrhage as well. Um, <clears throat> and so when we talk about these different um, OB emergencies, whether it's, a, you know, say a spontaneous abortion or a, a miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy, abrupto placente, placenta previa and uterine rupture, and even just normal postpartum hemorrhage. Each one of them have a significant risk of a loss of blood. Um, and if you guys can remember in your later stages of labor, um, there is a high risk, just there, there's, there's a highly vasculature, uh, vasculaturized um, system that is going through some pretty significant changes as as that last stage of labor occurs and the risk for trauma, the risk for damage to that tissue increases risk for uh, hemorrhage. So um, I think before we get too far into the emergencies, I think this would probably be a good place for a break actually. Um, so let's go ahead and take five. Um, we're going to put our next question up on the board. Um, and we'll have you guys answer this on the break. So this question um, is going to be, in simple terms, what causes tissue death, right? In simple terms, what causes tissue death? There's a couple different options here, right? 
Uh, a, a lack of perfusion of nutrients such as oxygen and glucose to the tissue. Uh, B, trauma. Or C, uh, an obstruction of blood flow. And so uh, answer that question to the best of your ability, and when we get back from break, we'll talk about it. All right, everybody, we're coming back from break. Um, give you a heads up, we're probably going to do an attendance check here pretty quick. But before we do that, uh, I want to go over the survey, the survey question that we asked before break, which the question is, in simple terms, what causes tissue death? Okay, uh, and so you had a couple of responses here, or options. You have a lack of perfusion of nutrients, such as oxygen and glucose to the tissue, uh, trauma, or an obstruction of blood flow. Now, uh, if any of you have ever taken a NREMT test, you're probably pretty familiar with the idea that uh, a lot of times there are questions that are kind of right, and then, or sorry, answers that are kind of right, and then answers that are actually extremely right. And so here, the answer is a lack of perfusion of nutrients, such as oxygen and glucose to the tissue. Now that can be caused secondary to trauma, and it can be caused due to some type of obstruction of blood flow. Now that can be an obstruction of blood flow that uh, is secondary to, you know, uh, ischemia caused by, by, you know, a blood clot, um, you know, say is like a PE, um, or uh, in ischemic stroke, you have a clot in one of the, the veins in the brain, right? Um, or in the case of a STEMI, you have a, a blockage of one of the coronary arteries. Uh, you know, in trauma, uh, obviously, if we have damage to the vasculature, then we're going to have damage to the uh, vessels that carry the blood flow and the nutrients to that tissue. Uh, and so that tissue is going to lack it. And so essentially, the, the root of it all is something is causing a lack of perfusion. Now, that could also be caused not by trauma or an obstruction, but it could be caused to, due to, say in the sepsis scenario, due to hypovolemia secondary to systemic uh, global vasodilation, right? So we've lost the ability to perfuse the tissue, right? In the cardiogenic shock, you may have a decrease in cardiac output, right? Um, and then similar to an obstruction and obstructive shock, you may have um, something that is preventing the mechanical uh, action of, of perfusion, right? So, uh, so with that in mind, uh, talking about uh, massive hemorrhage in OB-related emergencies. Uh, we covered these ones a little bit before. You have abortion, uh, which is a spontaneous miscarriage, right? Uh, ectopic pregnancy, abrupto placente, placenta previa, uterine rupture, and postpartum hemorrhage. Now, we're going to go through each one of these a little bit. We're going to kind of skim over, get a bird's eye view of what they are and kind of how they work. So first one I want to talk about is ectopic pregnancy. Now, with an ectopic pregnancy, uh, this is where the ovum implants outside of the uterus, more specifically in one of the fallopian tubes. And this is a problem because the fallopian tube is not designed to stretch and grow with the, uh, with the baby as it grows, right? And so as the, the fetus develops and it stretches, it can actually cause damage or trauma to the, uh, to the fallopian tube. And in that trauma, we can have a massive hemorrhage, okay? Um, now, a uh, ectopic pregnancy is usually characterized by abdominal pain, potentially some referred shoulder pain, uh, usually associated with vaginal bleeding, okay? Uh, and uh, amenorrhea may or may not be present. Uh, the key to remember, though, here is that ectopic pregnancies absolutely are a uh, emergency and require rapid transport and immediate intervention. There is a time critical component to managing a patient uh, suffering from an ectopic pregnancy. Um, again, similar to all the patients as before, we really want to monitor this patient uh, and treat for shock. There is a, a significant potential of the patient developing hypovolemic shock. Okay, moving along. Uh, we're going to talk about uterine rupture. Now, uterine rupture is a little bit different. Uh, this is where the ovum implants correctly in the uterus, and as the baby develops, um, there may be uh, something that is um, 
uh, potentially not as strong as it should be, say, as such as a uh, previous wound or a scar, say maybe from like a cesarean section. Um, maybe uh, uh, trauma is another big one, you know, uh, uh, a female, a pregnant female uh, in the presence of a motor vehicle accident. Uh, the trauma from the motor vehicle accident may cause damage to the uterus and cause it to rupture. Um, and then two, something to consider is any kind of prolonged or obstructed labor. If the uh, if the baby is unable to um, navigate the birth canal correctly uh, as the uh, uterus contracts, there can actually be damage to that uterine wall, okay? Um, and then obviously in the presence of any type of penetrating trauma, uh, rupture to the uter uterus. Now, um, the uterine rupture uh, is usually characterized by that, that sudden acute onset abdominal pain, they, they usually associate with a tearing sensation, right? They feel that, that rupture, that tear, uh, and you, you will have associated um, vaginal bleeding as well. Again, same as before, you want to monitor this patient and treat for shock. The patient could potentially develop a hypovolemic hemorrhagic style shock. Moving along, uh, abrupto placente. So, uh, in the abrupto placente, this is where the placenta um, becomes either partially or completely detached from the uterine wall. And if you guys can remember back to anatomy and physiology, the placenta is an extremely vasculaturized tissue, okay? It's designed to be able to uh, effectively, quickly, and efficiently get nutrients from the mother to the child. Um, now, this vasculature is designed to be um, secured up against that uterine wall, okay? And if it becomes detached, that placenta is still trying to uh, share that nutrient with the mother. Uh, and so we have the potential there for internal hemorrhage secondary to the detachment of the placenta. Now, there's two ways that this can occur. You can have a complete or a partial uh, uh, abruption. And arguably the the partial abruption is is more severe or or uh, uh, could be uh, more uh, could result in a higher problem for the patient um, in that uh, being a partial abruption that hemorrhage will be hidden uh, between the uh, uterus and the uterine or sorry the the placenta and the uterine wall. Uh, similar as you can see the in the picture to the right, you can see that blood uh, kind of um, gathering there in between that space. Whereas in a complete abruption, when it completely becomes attached, you'll actually have that uh, external hemorrhage. You'll have a, a vaginal bleeding associated with it. Uh, in the presence of a partial abruption, you have a patient who could be massively internally hemorrhaging and you don't know it because it's all collecting in between that space between the, uh, the uterine wall and the placenta. Um, now, this is characterized by sudden vaginal bleeding in the third trimester, abdominal pain, and then um, maybe potentially minimal abdominal or uh, uh, vaginal bleeding. So again, you wanna monitor this patient and treat for shock. Uh, again, hypovolemic shock being a high risk due to massive hemorrhage. So. Before we move on to the next slide, we got to do our, what I believe is potentially our last final, nope, it's not our last, I lied. Uh, one of our last uh, attendance checks. Um, <clears throat> and so, if you guys can remember, the should have a system down for this now. Uh, the chat pane pinned at the top will be a link. You got to go into that link, follow the directions uh, listed there, and your attendance check number is going to be 86800. 86800, and that's the number that you got to put in to be able to get the credit uh, for the live CEUs that we're offering here today. So, again, that attendance check number is 86800. Give you guys just a second here. All right. So we are going to move back into these OB emergencies. So we just covered the uh, abrupto placente, um, and now we are going to move into placenta previa. Now, 
uh, with placenta previa, this is where the placenta has implanted in, incorrectly, okay? Uh, rather than implanting up at the top of the uterus, nor where they normally implant, it actually uh, implants down towards the bottom uh, near the uh, opening of the cervix, right? This presents a couple problems. Um, the biggest thing that I want you to remember, though, is, is the placenta previa is going to be the one that is associated with painless bright red bleeding, okay? Painless bright red bleeding. And the reason for that, uh, if, you, if you look at the picture there where in the in the placenta previa where it's implanted towards the apex of, or sorry, the opening of the cervix, um, <clears throat> you'll notice that there's gonna be a space there uh, where the cervix is that placenta is not attached to the uterus. And so essentially what you have there, and this isn't actually the way it works, but this is the way I think about it, is you have an open wound there, right? You have, you have placental tissue that is exposed and not able to transfer the nutrients that it needs to appropriately. And so instead, it, it, it bleeds out into that uh, opening of the cervix and through the, the birth canal. And uh, um, <clears throat> that's why it's painless, because the body doesn't know that something's wrong. The, the, the placenta attached the way that it did, and it's just doing its job, and it doesn't know that anything's wrong. It's also one of the reasons why it's bright red, because it's coming from the placenta, right? Um, so uh, that blood is extremely jam-packed with the nutrients that it needs to be delivered to the baby. Uh, so again, that's characterized by painless bright red bleeding. Now, uh, usually that bleeding will increase uh, if labor begins, because as the uterus begins to contract, you start to have trauma to the um, placenta. Now, uh, another special thing to note is if you have this uh, present in your patient, it is time critical that you identify it and that you get this patient to say an OB, uh, LND um, center, that they can take care of it. Because as labor progresses, there is a high potential that as the baby tries to present through the birth canal, that you will have trauma both to the, the mother and the placenta, as well as to um, the baby. Uh, because now we have an obstruction that the baby has to try to be try to birth through essentially okay uh, and again just like all these before we're monitoring and, and trying to manage and treat for shock right because we have the potential for massive external hemorrhage all right <clears throat> so uh, next we have one that's a little bit different and this one doesn't this one's a little out of uh, the norm in the sense that it doesn't result in um, massive internal or external hemorrhage in and of itself, okay? And that is eclampsia, okay? Uh, eclampsia is, has a time-critical component because, because, well, let's first talk about what is eclampsia. So you have two states of this, right? You have preeclampsia and eclampsia. So preeclampsia is a pregnant female suffering from hypertension, or high blood pressure. Um, Preeclampsia progresses to be eclampsia if the patient begins having seizures. Those seizures caused by the stress of the hypertension during pregnancy. Okay, um, and so if you have a pregnant female who is hypertensive who is having a seizure, that female is eclamptic. Okay, now um, what I want you to think about is just like any other patient having a seizure, whether it's an epileptic seizure. Uh, febrile seizure, any anything, any other type of seizure, the life threat associated with seizures. I want you to think about that for a second. What is the life threat associated with seizures? Um, a lot of people will correlate the uh, kind of stress on the neurological system, um, and that is a, a potential risk and something that we need to treat for long term. But in an immediate life threat situation, uh, it's actually hypoxia, okay? And so the immediate life threat associated with eclampsia and seizures of, of any type is hypoxia. Now that's going to be secondary to the fact that the patient, when they're seizing, uh, you have to remember the diaphragm, which is responsible for respirations, breathing in and out. The diaphragm is a muscle just the same as any other muscle in the body. And if every muscle in your body is seizing, so is your diaphragm. And so your minute volume disappears. Um, 
almost essentially, right? Uh, you lose the effectiveness of the uh, inspiration and exhalation. You don't have good tidal volume. You don't have an effective respiratory rate and you begin to become hypoxic. Uh, obviously, there is a high risk for a, a patient causing trauma to themselves during a seizure. Uh, again, you just wanna kinda help them uh, stay as safe as they can during that seizure, but your main priority should be ventilatory support, okay? Uh, and that's so with something like positive pressure ventilation. Uh, uh, and you can argue as you go down that treatment modality, uh, you know, in the case of an epileptic seizure, stopping the seizure with a benzo and moving down that algorithm. <clears throat> in the case of eclampsia, uh, your treatment is actually mag sulfate, right? Uh, with mag sulfate being a potent smooth muscle relaxer, uh, reducing hypertension, reducing the stress on the brain. Um, you know, our dose here, two to six grams and 50 cc's over not less than 10 minutes. Uh, again, you're wanting to slowly infuse that because there's a significant risk of hypotension if you push it fast. Um, uh, something to note, uh, Versed is not necessarily contraindicated in pregnancy. Uh, it is not optimal, but if you have, say, an epileptic patient who has who is pregnant and they are having an epileptic seizure, you can give Versed. Um, I had a patient not too long ago that uh, I ended up looking at some retrospective studies after the case and found out that they actually use Versed uh, in OB situations for pain management during like cesarean sections. So it's not contraindicated, but it is not optimal too, because you have to remember that anything you give to the mom, you give to the baby. Um, and so we want to try to reduce uh, introducing any more than we absolutely have to, but we do need to manage those life threats up front and early. So, um, all right. Uh, and then moving on, um, not as immediate of a result in massive hemorrhage. We also have, um, some potential issues that, uh, require some time critical management and that's going to be abnormal presentations. Okay. Uh, so that's going to be things like a breech birth, cord presentation, nuchal cord, sodal dystocia, or a transverse presentation. And then, uh, you know, there's some other examples here of what those, what a social shoulder dystocia looks like, or especially uh, in the case of the nuchal cord, um, what that looks like. It's important to note, you know, and out of all the, the issues that we have here, uh, uh, a baby presenting with nuchal cord, this is the only patient that you may actually have to insert your hand into the patient so that you can navigate uh, resupplying blood flow and more specifically resupplying oxygen to the patient because in a nuchal cord scenario, you have a, um, uh, you have the cord wrapped around the baby's neck and potentially occluding either blood flow uh, and especially oxygenation and respiration. Um, and so again, all of these having a time management component during abnormal presentations, uh, if the baby is not positioned to come out correctly, the, the, the expulsion of the baby in the process of labor can actually cause damage and trauma both to the baby as well as um, to the mother. And so in these abnormal presentations, this is where we may consider giving something like uh, terbutaline, something like that to reduce the amount of contractions um, and, uh, hopefully kind of elongate labor so that they can get into contact with whatever their definitive care is, which again is gonna be an OBGYN, potentially a surgeon, uh, getting them into an OB and d uh, environment. So, um, and so uh, let's talk about that. Uh, Pre-hospital management of these OB emergencies, okay? First one, again, recognition, right? Assessment and identification. Uh, being able to differentiate how your patient is presenting uh, and what that correlates back to, whether it's, you know, say, abrupto placenta versus placenta previa, right? Um, your uh, ability to communicate with the patient is key here. I think it's something that we should spend a little bit of time on. Um, you being able to uh, communicate with the mother to get her consent and to keep her engaged in her health care. Um, you know, one of the most uncomfortable things is to be in a situation where you have no control. Uh, and you think about a mother in the later stages of labor, um, you know, uh, most likely that baby is going to mean everything to her. And keeping her engaged, letting her understand and know what's going on is important. Um, you don't need to be overtly uh, blunt and aggressive about sharing what's going on. But I think it's important that you tell the truth and that you, um, 
can uh, effectively communicate, you know, this is where we're at, this is what I'm seeing, this is what we need to do, and keeping them engaged and getting their consent. Um, also, during all of that, offering some maternal support and reassurance, helping the mother understand that both you know what you're doing and you know that you're getting them to the right definitive care and that things are going to be taken care of as quickly and as best as possible. Um, similar to all of the prior diagnoses, trauma, stroke, sepsis, uh, STEMI, we want to pre-alert the hospital and let them know this is what we're coming in with. I have a pregnant female who I believe or I suspect to have placenta previa or who I suspect to have, you know, maybe it's a uh, imminent delivery and you believe the patient uh, is having an abnormal, uh, the baby's having an abnormal presentation. Um, we do want to rapid transport these patients because we need to get them to definitive care. We need to get them to the, the OBGYN to get them to the, to the L&D area where they can really manage and navigate treating the patient uh, definitively, right? <clears throat> we do want to continually monitor these patients and uh, assess and reassess for the potential for shock and, and treating for hypovolemia or various different other things. Um, we want to continue to reassess as well because those things change quickly, right? Uh, we can have a patient that's compensating for a significant amount of time uh, who then begins to decompensate and they may need a little bit more care from us. We talked about this a little bit already. Um, so definitive care for the OB emergency um, is going to be um, that definitive care, right? Uh, uh, ED, L and D, OBGYN, and the surgeon. And you could talk long-term, depending on the nature of the severity, step-down units and uh, ICUs potentially, um, depending on how that patient's prognosis and differential diagnosis went. Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, moving right along. Um, now we're going to move into something that some of you are probably very familiar with, something that we see uh, a lot even on primetime TV, and that is diabetes, okay? Um, diabetes can cause us a, a lot of issues, cause patients a lot of issues. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, uh, thumbs, we have uh, um, two uh, major diagnoses in, in diabetes, and that's going to be hypoglycemia and then hyperglycemia. So really low blood sugar, and really high blood sugar. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and so let's talk about that. So uh, first thing you got to understand is that there's, there are two types of diabetes, right? Type one and type two. And some of you are probably very familiar with that. Um, type one being the, the diabetes in which your body can no longer produce insulin, right? You have to take uh, insulin synthetically, right? Um, or, or alternatively being type two diabetes, which is where your body still produces the insulin, um, but it can't use it effectively, right? Uh, maybe there's an insulin resistance. Um, and so uh, again, there isn't the appropriate diffusion across the cellular membranes. Now, the way I always remember that is type one, a one looks like a needle, right? And so Type 1s have to use shots and, and take uh, insulin uh, that's prescribed to them. Whereas type 2, uh, I, I always think about it, a 2 looks like a, a, ne a bent needle, right? And so uh, that patient has probably developed it over time from, from um, you know, say, poor dietary habits. Um, and they usually regulate with diet and nutrition and that kind of thing. So um, most of the time... Uh, when you deal with an emergent uh, diabetic situation, you're dealing with a type 1 diabetic, someone who's really struggling to navigate um, maintaining a consistent blood sugar level. Um, <clears throat> now, with, um, with that, when we talk about which one do we do the most for, uh, that's going to be hypoglycemia, right? Blood sugar that has gone low, right? Uh, so you show up on scene, you have a patient, will probably present uh, extremely confused, lethargic, may even be unconscious. Um, they may just be acting strange, just that general altered mental status. Um, you want to have a high suspicion of, of a diabetic emergency. Um, and obviously any known history, family's usually pretty good at being able to tell you whether or not the patient's diabetic. Um, also looking around the scene, do you see, you know, insulin syringes or, or prescriptions, that kind of thing. Um, in the hypoglycemic case, 
what we want to do is correct the sugar. We want to bring the sugar back up to a normal level. Uh, now, uh, in that scenario, um, we use uh, um, a couple different uh, medications. I guess it's the same medication, but a couple different ways of delivering that medication. And so a common one that's been around for years was the D50 or the 50% dextrose, um, which um, most, I think most services have kind of gotten away from pushing quite such an aggressive amount of sugar as quickly as you would with uh, D50. And most services I think are moving towards a, a D10 solution uh, for a couple different reasons. Um, you know, D50 is uh, very thick, very syrupy, um, and in your patients who present um, in hypoglycemia, potentially even diabetic shock, uh, you get the clamp down vasculature, it's difficult to get IV access. Oftentimes when you do get IV access, it's a, you know, it's a 20 or a 22 and a hand or a foot, or you can finally get IV access. And if you're trying to push D50 through a 20 gauge needle, uh, one, it's extremely difficult, and then two, you have a high risk for infiltration as you try to slam that through. You're creating so much pressure, uh, you can actually infiltrate the vein. And something we know is that sugar and the extravascular space outside of the of the veins is bad. It's it's extremely necrotic. Uh, it can cause damage and and deterioration of tissue. Right, so we don't want that. Uh, in the D10 solution, uh, it's a lower amount of sugar. Um, that is, uh, it's a lower concentration, not necessarily lower amount, but lower concentration of sugar, which um, makes the, the delivery a lot smoother um, because you don't have that thick syrupy sugar. Um, it's able to get through the IV efficiently and effectively. And then two, uh, rather than slamming a diabetic with a significant amount of sugar and kind of sending them into that, that diabetic seizure almost, you get uh, a slow, steady increase of their blood sugar, and it's a lot less, um, it's, it's not as hard on the patient as they come out of that hypoglycemic state. Um, they come up more like they're waking up from a, from a deep sleep, uh, which is better for the patient. It's better for the provider too, because oftentimes when you slam D50 on a hypoglycemic, they can come up confused, scared, uh, maybe even a little combative, and doing it slower uh, kind of reduces some of that risk. Um, now in the instance that your patient's blood sugar is low, but they're still conscious, maybe they're still able to talk to you as long as they still have an intact gag reflex. We also can give them, um, oral glucose, right? Um, you can give them, um, you know, we carry just the tubes of oral glucose. There's other different things. Uh, some diabetics will carry the, the tabs of sugar on them. They'll have them in their pockets or something. Uh, additionally, too, a patient who can swallow and who's fairly coherent, you can just have them eat food. Um, you know, peanut butter sandwich, orange juice, apple juice, something that's got some simple carbs in it that can be absorbed by the body. It's important to note, though, that if you are administering um, any type of oral glucose, uh, that glucose has to diffuse into the body. Now, there are some arguments that if you... Um, that if you uh, put it inside the, the mucosal membranes that will diffuse faster. That's not necessarily wrong. It does diffuse faster, but the volume at which it's gonna diffuse is significantly lower. So you're not gonna see a significant increase in blood sugar doing that. Um, so, um, uh, and then finally, the last one is going to be, uh, you know, something like glucagon, right? We carry glucagon on our trucks. Um, that is a hormone that's produced by the body. When given, it, it forces the body to release all of its glycogen stores. Um, the important thing to remember with that, though, is that if um, you give it, you need to be severely concerned with restocking and restoring those uh, glycogen stores. Okay, so and uh, what what we do initially to manage hypoglycemia as well as hyperglycemia. So obviously, initially, it's going to be assessment and identification. We need to be able to quickly identify that our patient's hypoglycemic. Um, in order to do that, uh, you know you know your associated signs and symptoms, something similar as an altered mental status, um, known diabetic history, so on, and then the presentation that we talked about. Um, <clears throat> being able to take a blood sugar quickly, get that vital sign, know whether it's low or high, um, you get in your vitals assessment. Now remember that you want to get a comprehensive set of vitals. It's important to remember that anytime the body gets stressed, 
uh, you could have a response in the, the blood sugar system. Um, so if you've had a significant decrease in blood sugar, you might want to be suspicious that other things could be going on. Okay, a um, patient could have had a seizure or could have had a, uh, various other significant um, medical or cardiac issues. Um, <clears throat> you want to monitor and treat this patient for shock. Um, again, as that body starts to struggle with hypoglycemia and not getting the glucose that it needs, the tissues will not be functioning properly, your brain will start to shut down, your respiratory rate will decrease, you'll become hypoxic, and as all of that stuff kind of devolves, you can go into kind of like that diabetic shock state. Um, <clears throat> as uh, these things progress, uh, we talked about medication administration, right? Are we going to administer dextrose or um, food if they can swallow? We do want to continually reassess that patient. Now, definitive care for this patient may be something as simple as a ED physician in an emergency room, somebody who can uh, get that patient back to a stable regulated blood sugar. True definitive care is going to include um, maybe an endocrinologist, somebody who can manage, help manage that patient's blood sugar long term. So, <clears throat> all right. Um, Moving into cardiac arrest. So uh, we talked a little bit, well, actually, let me back up one step. Um, so in the, in the pre-hospital management of, of diabetes, remember too, you can also have hyperglycemia. In the presence of hyperglycemia, um, <clears throat> you have uh, an excessively high blood sugar, something that's say, you know, 500, 600, or maybe even just reads high on your glucometer some excessive amount of blood sugar. Uh, you risk running into something like diabetic ketoacidosis, um, you know, those kind of um, metabolic acidosis states. Um, really, you're not gonna be presented necessarily with as emergent of a life threat with that patient. Um, they'll probably be mentating fairly okay. Um, the key for them though is getting them to a hospital where they can get insulin and get that blood sugar under control and any other signs and symptoms or side effects that they may be having. So, okay. So now let's talk cardiac arrest. Um, so cardiac arrest is, is honestly, it's pretty simple. Um, there's not a whole lot to really managing cardiac arrests effectively. Uh, the key, though, is, you know, managing your scene and managing yourself as a provider to navigate um, those issues. So uh, on the screen here, uh, I've got several different rhythms. Um, some of them you may be familiar with. Um, if you don't operate at a medic level, you may not know exactly what you're looking at. Um, the rhythm in the top left is going to be ventricular tachycardia. Uh, that's an extremely fast heart rate uh, driven in the lower part of the heart in the ventricles. Um, you can have this uh, presence of this with a pulse as well as without a pulse, okay? Um, directly below that, you have what's called torsades de points, right? Um, or polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. This is a ventricular rhythm that kind of moves around the heart, okay? Which is why you get kind of like that sound wave effect. Now, for those of you who have worked in the field, you know that you probably aren't going to have a torsades that looks as clear as that does. Um, Directly below that, you have a rhythm that most people in a cardiac arrest scenario associate with what's called PEA, okay? Pulseless electrical activity. Now, uh, I want to make an important distinction here. Um, I want you to remember that technically any electrical activity in the presence of a lack of pulses is pulseless electrical activity. Um, and so when you're trying to... Um, navigate your differential diagnosis, you may need to consider, um, you know, what is that underlying cause, the underlying causality of the lack of pulses, right? Um, because clearly you have electrical capture, you are lacking mechanical capture. Moving along the top right screen, flat line, right? Uh, the things everybody sees in movies that they seem to shock back. Um, Flatline, also known as asystole, uh, you may hear some providers say asystole. Um, really what this is, is a complete lack of cardiac activity. Um, and then directly below it, you have a coarse ventricular fibrillation, right? Um, now I put all this up in, this, in front of the screen just to make a couple quick distinctions. Um, there are two 
um, rhythms on the screen that we uh, want to shock for and we want to shock quickly for. They are our shockable rhythms. Um, and that's going to be the one on the top left, ventricular tachycardia, and the one on the bottom right, ventricular fibrillation. Um, now, you can shock torsades, but you need to consider some causality in there. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, if your patient is in ventricular tachycardia and they have a pulse, then you want to synchronize cardiovert and not just defibrillate. Versus if your patient lacks a pulse and is in VTAC, you can just defibrillate. And then, uh, of course, VFib, you're not going to have a consistent or um, pulse at all, and so you'll defib that. Uh, remember that you cannot defibrillate asystole, okay? Um, and we don't defibrillate the, the PEA sinus rhythm uh, because we need to consider some different causalities as to why the heart has lost its mechanical capture, okay? Um, at the end of the day, though, uh, any of these that result in a lack of actual perfusion, right, a lack of, of mechanical capture, that lack of a pulse rate and a support of that circulatory system, the first thing we want to do is what? CPR, right? Well, first we got to recognize the patient is, is not um, uh, in a stable state, right? And that's that no, no, go scenario, right? Do you have normal breathing and are they responsive? And if they're not, if no normal breathing and no response, then start CPR, right? That's the patient um, who you're like, hey, hey, little Timmy, are you okay? and they're not breathing and they're not responding, start CPR. Um, now, there's an important distinction to be made here. You'll notice on your screen that you have a column for adults and a column for children. In your adult uh, treatment modality, you're gonna, you're gonna start CPR and then you're gonna prioritize uh, getting the monitor attached and getting early defibrillation. We wanna identify, does our patient have a rhythm that can be defibrillated, such as VTAC or VFib. Um, with that uh, scenario, we want to get that done early because we think most likely that in an adult scenario that the cardiac arrest is secondary to uh, cardiac etiology. <clears throat> That's different from the pediatric in which we obviously prioritize CPR, but then prior to doing anything else, we need to get airway support, more specifically ventilatory support, whether that's with an NPA and a face mask, positive pressure ventilation, dropping an extra glottic, um, uh, something like an eye gel, uh, whatever it may be. But <clears throat> we know that in children, very, 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 very rarely, uh, in fact, unless they have a, an underlying congenital defect or something, very rarely is, is their, um, their cardiac arrest is going to be secondary to a cardiac issue. It's probably going to be secondary to respiratory arrest. So we want to give at least two minutes or so of CPR and airway support and then move down the rest of that algorithm into defibrillation and all other things into our critical thinking algorithms. Um, <clears throat> whereas the adults will, will do the monitor, then the airway, and then all other things, right? Um, <clears throat> now, when we talk about pre-hospital management, obviously we need to recognize it. We need to kind of navigate this, um, this CPR treatment modality, whether it's CPR monitor, airway, all other things, uh, or in the case of a pediatric CPR airway, defib, all other things. Then um, we need to consider rapid transport in the, in the presence that we get the patient. Uh, if we get pulses back and we, we achieve what they call ROSC, right? Return of spontaneous circulation. If we get that in the field, um, then we want to go ahead and consider transport to the hospital. We do want to pre-alert the emergency department, um, let them know that we're coming in with a post-resuscitative patient. Um, we do want to continue to reassess that patient, get a lot more vitals, um, you know, get a full set of vitals, uh, manage and treat for hypothermia, um, and, and manage and treat for shock. Now, uh, if we take a step back to the, uh, the cardiac rhythms, slide, uh, an important note that I want to make is in the presence of PEA, as most people call it, or, or the sinus rhythm that you see on the bottom left of your screen, um, in the presence of PEA and a traumatic arrest, say uh, somebody who's been in a motor vehicle accident, somebody who's had maybe a GSW, something like that, um, you... Um, you are going to potentially have a risk for obstructive shock, right? Because you have electrical activity, but you lack mechanical capture, right? So something is occluding the mechanical blood flow. 
most likely in a traumatic scenario, a tension pneumothorax, right? Uh, something that is occluding or compressing the heart or the inferior and superior vena cava. In which case, in a traumatic arrest in the presence of PEA, we would needle decompress uh, the chest in an attempt to try to re-perfuse or regain mechanical capture. So, okay, um, we're going to take a quick break. This is the last break um, in our slideshow here, and we're going to do a quick uh, survey. And so uh, the last survey uh, we're going to talk about as we finish this, uh, this thing up, and I just kind of wanted to get an idea of where your guys' heads are at prior to going into it. So uh, this question is, when should you, as a provider, be preparing yourself for patient care? Um, and there's only, two, there's only two, two answers, right? Before you're needed or as soon as you make contacts because there are too many variables to account for. So when should you as a provider be preparing yourself for patient care? Before you are needed or after you've made that patient contact because that's when you get the information that you need. So uh, take a minute, answer that question, and uh, we'll be back in five. All right, everybody. So we're coming back from our last and final break. And in front of you, you have a survey. This was the question we asked right before break. And it was a very simple question. When should you be preparing as a provider, preparing yourself for patient care? One answer was before you are needed, and then the second was as you make patient contact because there are too many variables to account for. All right, we'll get the responses pulled up here, and we'll take a look at what you guys think. So, all right. Looks like we had four for before you're needed and two for uh, as, you make, as soon as you make patient contact because there's too many variables. So I think as a whole, most people feel that you should be getting ready for patient care prior to when you are needed. And I would agree that that is correct. Um, so <clears throat> um, this last little thing that we're just going to kind of use to tie everything together is this concept uh, that I've come to know as task load on the surface, right? Um, first time I ever heard that was a friend of mine who goes diving talked about uh, this idea of task load on the surface. And what the idea is, is that <clears throat> when you dive, uh, the deeper you go down, the more you become oxygen deprived, the more pressure you feel, the more you begin to lose the ability to think critically. And so uh, if you end up in a uh, in a life-threatening or a, uh, you know, a severe incident uh, while you're underwater, it's better to have been prepared uh, prior to going down, having contingencies built up, um, knowing what your emergency plans are, uh, knowing uh, what your steps are to get yourself out of that situation. And I think that <clears throat> transcends just that specific incident and, and really uh, is a lot to do with what we do in pre-hospital care, uh, whether you're a, um, you know, a first responder, a, a career firefighter, a career uh, paramedic or EMT, or whatever it may be. Um, and so <clears throat> as we talk about this concept of task load on the surface, really what we need to be thinking about is the fact that <clears throat> patient care really begins for us uh, prior to uh, contact with that patient. Um, understanding, you know, we go through your different medical training, your trauma training, that's getting you familiar with the, uh, the, the way, the pathology, the pathophysiology, the anatomy and physiology of the body, so that as you come into these situations, you have that greater medical knowledge and that greater medical experience that will expose you uh, to being able to make good decisions, okay? Um, and then something that we've come to know um, in our environment is that in a pre-hospital environment, our scenes change. And sometimes they even change drastically while we're on scene. Um, and, and the increase in 
uh, demands for our attention, whether it be multiple uh, providers, uh, multiple patients, uh, multiple sources of information, and then too, just the general background noise. You know, imagine you look at this slide here, imagine trying to take care of a trauma patient in the midst of all these people walking around and talking and the noises of buses and cars and things driving by. It can be very, very, very difficult. Uh, and <clears throat> when we begin to feel that stress, our body's response to stress is fight or flight. One of the first things to go in fight or flight is our cognitive function, our ability to make decisions and think critically. Um, and in that situation, dealing with a patient, say the, the driver of the vehicle that's facing us, um, <clears throat> if, if we're trying to effectively manage care for that patient, but we also have all this other things, all these other things competing for our attention, it can be easy to either make mistakes, forget steps, um, and even uh, completely not even think about something that we need to be doing. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, as we progress through these um, scenes, I want you to kind of think about how do you, how do you effectively manage um, getting adequate patient care and getting appropriate things done quickly in a pre-hospital environment. We know that we can't provide long-term care on the side of the road, um, but we have some things that we need to manage and treat immediately, um, you know, and sometimes the decisions we make may be dictated by our operational capacity at the time. Um, you know, we talk about the March algorithm and the fact that massive hemorrhage is our absolute number one priority in the presence of trauma. However, if you look at this scene, um, I've got some things I need to get taken care of before I deal with massive hemorrhage, and that's directly correlated with my safety. You can remember back to your NRENT trauma assessment, right? Everything starts with BSI scene safe, right? You don't wanna just go run and jump into this car that's hanging off a bridge, okay? Um, so we may not address the the hemorrhage until we can safely get to the patient. Um, same thing with managing airways. We may, we may decide to go, even though we know an ET tube may be more definitive, we may go with a superglottic because it's more efficient and effective at navigating in a pre-hospital environment. Um, <clears throat> you know, if we are in a rural area, um, I, you know, my normal treatment modality may be to run up, get my trauma patient, throw them back to the ambulance, go to the hospital. But if I'm in a rural location, say like this, I may want to consider potentially landing a helicopter right there at the scene um, so that I can efficiently and effectively get that patient to definitive care. Again, all my decisions, everything that I think about in regards to taking care of a patient, I try to make decisions that are in line with what is going to result in a positive outcome at discharge from hospital, not just right now. Because I can do things right now that will make the patient better for right now but that may not result in a long-term improvement of care. Um, you know, in a situation like this, I could run into the building to try to save somebody, but if I don't consider my own safety, that building could collapse on me, and that does not result in a positive outcome for that patient that discharged from hospital because now I've become a, a liability in another patient, and I'm not providing care for that individual. Um, <clears throat> you know, in the, in the presence of an MCI, uh, say like a mass casualty shooting, um, if you're the initial provider on scene or even one of the many initial providers on scene, your job may be triage and trying to navigate those, those three preventable deaths, control massive hemorrhage, uh, you know, open and, and create um, uh, adequate airways, and then and, you know, ensure your patient doesn't have a tension pneumo. You may just be navigating patients into the left lateral recumbent, head tilt, chin lift, and throwing on tourniquets and just keeping on trucking. Now, normally as a provider, our, our goal is to become fixated on that one patient and take care of that patient because they need us. But if we aren't effective at navigating those priorities of care, then we don't move on to the other patients that we could potentially save. And that's, again, dictated by the operational environment. Okay? And so... As we kind of tie this thing together, the things I want you to think about in regards to your environment is that <clears throat> similar to like we started out um, at the beginning of this case when I talked about the similarities between uh, a combat environment and, and pre-hospital uh, emergency healthcare, whether it's for trauma or medical, 
We work in a dynamic environment. Our scenes consistently change. They are consistently developing and devolving. If any of you have ever worked in a car accident, you've probably been on scene of a car accident and witnessed another car accident. Um, that scene is continually changing and growing. Maybe it's deteriorating. Um, and we have to keep in mind how we do things. We may not immediately begin ventilating a patient. We may just do a head tilt chin lift to open the airway and then do a rapid extrication or rapid evac into a uh, unknown location, say the back of the ambulance, <clears throat> so that we can do the best we can, but then get them to a place where we can provide high quality care, right? Um, <clears throat> I also want you to think about that you're often dealing with a lack of resources. Um, you know, those of you who work out in first responder agency areas, it's often you and you alone. And so you don't have the adequate staffing that you need to be able to do the best that you possibly can. And so you're going to have to adapt. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, EMS agencies um, that respond out into rural areas that don't have first responder agencies. It's often you and your partner, and that's all you have to deal with. Uh, the supplies change, the peoples change, all those different things change, and that changes sometimes what we are capable of doing. Um, you know, a great example of that is <clears throat> in the in the rural environment, you may it may be normal for your modality to call for a helicopter, but if the weather is inclement, if you have severe storms, then that may not be an option, and so your treatment modality may change. Okay. And so uh, what I want you to think about is as all of that stuff starts to weigh in on you, um, you're going to feel some disorder and confusion. You may feel like uh, you have a lack of information. Um, you may um, feel like there's no clear source of information or there's multiple sources of information. Um, <clears throat> you may lose the ability to even see or hear because you become so tunnel vision on what's going on. Just remember to fall back on the 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 things that you know, the things that you do, your March algorithm, the, the trauma assessment, the things that you do to navigate um, effective patient care, okay? Um, <clears throat> I want you to remember, when we talk about should you be getting ready before or after patient contact, you never rise to the level of your expectation, you fall to the level of your training. And so you should be training, you should be educating, you should be learning prior to. That's what all of this is about. That's why we offer this is to try to reach out and give you opportunities to build your skill set um, and improve your ability to navigate those stressful environments. Um, and just to kind of tie everything up, remember all of this comes together. You got four things that you need to support life. You need an intact and adequate circulatory system. You need an intact and adequate ventilatory system. You need to support the perfusion of oxygen and glucose. And you're doing your job, right? Transport your patients to the hospital. Provide timely and adequate information to the receiving facility, uh, which if you look at Brant's five commandments, that's our medical director. Those are his things, right? Control major hemorrhage, ensure adequate ventilation, support the perfusion of oxygen and glucose, provide timely and adequate information to the appropriate receiving facility, and transport the ill and injured to the hospital. So uh, when all else fails and you don't know what to do, it's hard to make a decision, just prioritize and execute. Pick, a, pick something to move towards. Um, and, and, and execute it until it's completion. If you're stuck, if you're, you're lost in this chaos loop, right? Um, you simply pick something. If you think you need to do a blood pressure, do a blood pressure, but continue it until you get the blood pressure. Don't get halfway through taking a blood pressure and then decide you want to do a trauma assessment. Don't be starting your trauma assessment and decide you want to do a blood pressure. Start your trauma assessment and complete it because that information will be invaluable to you at being able to navigate your decisions moving forward in patient care. Um, this next one, I'm going to click through uh, a lot of slides here. I just generally want to show this to you. This is something that uh, we've come to use in our service that I think is very effective. Um, it's actually designed by an Air Force fighter pilot. It's called the OODA loop. It's a, it's a thing that's designed for operational and situational awareness. Um, <clears throat> and so the OODA loop stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. Uh, and essentially all we've done is codified it for emergency medical care. So in the observation phase, that's where you gather information, right? Anything you can possibly get. In the orient phase, that's where you take your, your ability as a clinician, your, your provider experience, your medical knowledge and your medical experience, and you use that through differential diagnosis to move yourself towards what you believe to be the problem. 
And then as you work through that differential diagnosis, making decisions on treatments and mitigating risk and navigating that kind of confidence in yourself and humility in yourself as a provider. And then finally, at the end of the day, sometimes as providers, we end up in uncomfortable situations, but we still have to do our job. We have to move. We have to act. Okay. Um, just remember, remain calm. Um, slow is smooth. Smooth is fast. Um, and at the end of the day, all you got to do is relax, look around and make a call. So um, with that, that is all I have. Um, I think is a general idea. Um, well, I'll give an opportunity here, and if anybody wants to submit a question to Jessica, they can submit a question. I'll see if I can answer them in the last five minutes here. Um, while you guys do that, um, I want to remind you, so this has been the Cox Health Emergency Responder Training Series, also known as CERTS, right? Uh, this is kind of our uh, hospital's way of being able to give back to the community during this uh, this COVID pandemic and being able to uh, meet the CEU requirements that you guys need to maintain your, uh, your licenses. It also allows us to kind of offer some value to you and being able to improve the, the healthcare of the communities that you serve um, through high quality education and research and, and help us achieve our vision of becoming the best for those who need us. Um, as you guys finish and tie these things up, remember to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. That way you guys can get notifications when these classes go on. We try to do them pretty regularly and the education department here at Cox CMS is always uh, innovating and adapting and creating new ways to provide value for you guys. And the best way to get that value is to be subscribed so that you can get those notifications and get that information as, as it comes out timely and efficiency. It's really simple. All you got to do is hit the, the little bell to get the notifications, right? You guys are familiar with social media if you're here. Um, make sure to give the thumbs up to the video. That helps us get some traction in regards to being seen. Uh, we want to try to get this information out to anybody who we can. And again, this is free information and, and we just want to get that information out so that everybody can benefit from it. And then, uh, like I said, just subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on that uh, on those ed education, education videos. Um, and then, uh, before I do the thank yous, did we get anything? Just one last attendance check. Do we need to? Okay. All right. So, um, well, you guys don't seem to have any questions. So hopefully I did my job. Um, if, if you, uh, if you don't, then don't hesitate to reach out. We'll do the best we can. Uh, so some special thank yous, um, go to, uh, Aubrey Johnson. Uh, he's been a lot of the planning and development for this entire series. He's kind of helped brainstorm and steamroll and, and organize and implement all of this. Um, Kyle Meadows, uh, he's been the logistics officer for all of this. He's been facilitating all the be behind the scenes stuff, making sure that systems are working appropriately um, and that uh, you guys are able to get this content. Um, it's really important that we have him. Uh, Brandon Foster, uh, he's the one that's been over here kind of giving me my direction. He's the one that's really making the rubber meet the road in regards to you guys being able to see and hear me. Uh, he's been supportive of this uh, since the beginning. Uh, he does a great job at being able to uh, provide that, uh, that high quality experience for you guys through this virtual environment. Uh, special thanks to Jessica Estes. Uh, she's been the uh, kind of operations chief for all of this. She navigates um, you know, um, the moderation of all the questions and making sure that the attendance checks works and, um, you know, just facilitating that I stay on time and that the instructors stay on time and that we are providing this value to you in a timely and efficient manager. Um, obviously we want to thank our medical director, doc Dr. Matthew Brandt. Um, he has been, um, a essential person in being able to, um, you know, support this mission and, um, help us get high quality uh, education out there. And then right along with him, uh, we need to thank our manager here in education, which is Russell Scanlon. Um, you know, his uh, involvement in the education department, his um, trust and faith in us to be able to uh, get this education out to you, uh, his support of the program and, and, and the things that he wants to do to help provide value for you guys is really what's created a lot of this. Um, and then finally, um, <clears throat> we want to thank our director here at Cox Health EMS because he's been supportive of this and trying to help uh, bridge that gap between the COVID pandemic and the CEUs that are required for uh, all of us in our different uh, um, uh, pre-hospital and, and even hospital-based setting uh, CEU requirements. Um, so, uh, and then I would just like to personally thank you for attending. 
Um, I think that this is pretty awesome. It's a, an extreme value to me. I appreciate the opportunity to get in front of you and, and share this information with you. Um, and then I look forward, uh, we're going to move into the uh, chapter four of the CERTS program. You'll see a lot of uh, information coming out on that uh, in the days to come, days to follow. Uh, chapter four is going to be over functional safety. We're going to have two uh, special guests. Um, that's secret right now. We'll uh, share that with you uh, hopefully soon. Um, I believe it's going to be on April 12th. Uh, it's April 12th, 2021 at 0900. Like I said, that information will be released later. And that's it. I uh, hope you guys stay safe out there and let us know if you need anything.